dear colleagues, dear delegates, it is my great pleasure again to welcome you all today for our daily meeting. But before we start, I would like to mention our condolences and sentiments to the People's Republic of China for the difficult situation they are facing. And also comment the work of the President of this session for his extraordinary work and smart leading. Now it's my great pleasure to welcome you all for a daily meeting again. This morning, the Bureau held its 12th meeting. The Bureau reviewed the progress of work, and I recall that during our prolonged meet meeting yesterday, the committee inscribed six new properties on the World Heritage List and also approved eight minor boundary modifications and 11 statements of OUV. Again, let me congratulate sincerely, once again, all state parties concerned. Congratulations to you all. The committee also decided to adjourn the examination of draft decision 8B.43 until tomorrow, once the general item 8 has been reviewed. Due to time constraints, we could not review items 8D, 8E, and 9A as it was planned. Also regarding item 8C, which was initially foreseen to be examined yesterday, but due to this item, and it can only be dealt with once all nominations have been examined, we will only be able to review later on this session today. Then as for today's meeting, after examining items, items 8D, 8E, and 9A, which are all for adoption without discussion, the committee will review the reports on the results of the third cycle of the periodic reporting exercise for two regions. The Arab states on the region under item 10A and the Africa region under item 10B. We will also examine item 10C and item 10D, which are also both put in front of you for adoption without discussion. Then the committee will then examine two decisions on point seven, 7.1 and 7.2 related to general conservation item. Also, as you remember, general items 8, 11 and 12 are still open for, are still open until tomorrow. I trust that the consultations among committee members called for by the chairperson are progressing well and that we will have text to look at tomorrow. Dear colleagues, dear delegates, in spite of this heavy workload of today, should we finish all the items ahead of time, I would suggest that the, we advance item 13 on international assistance today instead of keeping it for tomorrow. In addition, the Bureau recommended that the outcomes of the drafting group on item 8B.24 be brought back to the committee today, and we will do so at the end of the plenary meeting. And then last but not least, the Bureau meeting of tomorrow will take place at 10.30 Paris time sharp instead of 11 due to time constraints and a busy agenda. So we will start half an hour earlier tomorrow, 10.30 Paris time. Thank you very much. We shall now move to our agenda item 8D, devoted to the issue of the clarifications of property boundaries in areas of state parties. Please refer to document 8D. As you recall, by decision 15ext.com3, the committee decided that this agenda item would be adopted without debate. Therefore, I invite you, dear colleagues, to proceed with the adoption of the draft decision 44.8D. But before doing so, I would like to ask the reporter if she has received any amendments of the draft decision proposed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We haven't received any amendments on this draft decision, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Ms. Reporter. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I would like to go back to Oman. Oman, you have your hand raised. Is there anything you would like to? Please, Thank Oman, you, go ahead. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Um, my point, I was meant to raise it yesterday before the end, but, but we had um, a long session, and I thought I can start today with this point. Yesterday we have been or we had been discussing minor, bound, minor boundary modification and most if not all of the reports presented were referred back. Then we have heard comments from France yesterday that this um, when they submitted there were no connection or not even contact between the advisory body, World Heritage Center and the member state parties. I mean it is a bit alarming to see some of the decision without discussion with member states. And therefore, I would like to have clarification from the World Heritage Center and all the advisory body. What is the process in such um, uh, reports and, and, and decision taking? I thank you. Thank you, Man. Thank you for your comments. So um, we will go ahead with point 8D, item 8D, and then we will go back to your request. Thank you very much. So after hearing Ms. Reporter hasn't received any amendments of the draft decision of decision 44.8D. Are there any comments on that? I see none. Therefore, I declare draft decision 44.8D adopted. Thank you. Item 8D is now closed. Bosnia, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je ne sais pas, est-ce que c'est est -ce est le temps à poser la question concernant une discussion que nous avons eue à, à, à concernant les, 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 danos, les, les, les limites, de, de, les, les projets de, de Danube de plusieurs pays qui ont proposé ça. Et puis, il y avait une consultation où je n'étais pas présent. Je ne sais pas qu'est-ce qui s'est passé après. On a, on a compris que, que c'était un précédent, qu'il s'agit d'abord d'un sujet, d'une proposition qui était considérée comme acceptable, comme deux fois même recommandé pour l'inscription. Et puis, il se trouve que cette, cette proposition est quelque part, je ne sais pas où. Est-ce qu'on peut, est qu peut en savoir davantage? C'est la question de, de la Hongrie qui s'est retirée de, de, et qui, était, qui faisait partie de, 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 de cette de cette activité transfrontalière, de ce projet transfrontalière. Est-ce qu'on est qu peut savoir de quoi, qu'est-ce qui se passe finalement avec, avec ce projet? C'est dommage d'avoir de, 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 et puis de perdre un tel, un tel, une telle proposition. Et on a déjà dit que c'était le précédent, qu'un pays se retire, mais qu'un pays se retire, ça, 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 ça arrive, mais que les projets se partent dans les oubliettes, ça, ça, ça pose un problème. Voilà. Je pose la question, qu'est-ce qui se passe avec, avec ça Est-ce qu'on peut... Est-ce qu'on peut en savoir davantage Est-ce qu'on peut, est qu peut voir comment résoudre ce, ce sujet Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Bosnia, for your comment. Um, it is noted, as we uh, mentioned before, uh, the item 8B.24 is included in the agenda for today, and we will discuss at the end of the um, timetable that we had proposed, so it's included on the agenda. But also, I would like to ask the director of the World Heritage Center to take the floor, please. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and I would like to confirm what you just uh, said. Uh, this was discussed in the Bureau, so for the information of the delegation of Bosnia, and uh, the floor was given um, to um, the chair of that drafting group uh, uh, to brief us, and so this item will be taken up later on. Furthermore, I would like to clarify the question from uh, Oman. Um, the minor boundary for, um, modifications go in accordance with um, paragraphs 163 and 164 of the operational uh, guidelines. So um, state parties request this minor boundary modification and they send it in, uh, in accordance with the format which you have in Annex 11 of the uh, uh, operational guidelines and it has to be received by the 1st of February and then um, by the Secretariat and then the advisory body is evaluating. I uh, also noted the comments of France, and I also agree uh, that um, I think there needs to be uh, a reinforced dialogue, uh, if possible, um, so that uh, state parties don't lose too much time. So um, I think we will take this up um, uh, with the Secretariat and the advisory bodies. Thank you very much. And I think that Icomos may wish to comment as well as maybe Mr. Balsamo. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosler. Um, please, Ecomos, you have the floor. Je vous remercie, uh, Monsieur le Président. Et comme uh, l'a mentionné uh, Madame la Directrice du Centre, effectivement, on a un calendrier bien défini, mais serré également pour évaluer les modifications mineures de délimitation, c'est-à-dire que l'Ecomos dispose de trois mois pour procéder à ces évaluations et n'a pas l'opportunité dans ce calendrier restreint d'avoir euh, un dialogue avec les États parties, euh, mais nous sommes à la disposition euh, des États membres et notamment de la France euh, qui l'a demandé, nous sommes à la disposition des États membres pour euh, avoir des réunions et clarifier tout ce qui serait nécessaire pour continuer le travail sur ces modifications mineures. Je vous remercie, euh, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. Et comment, uh, Mr. Balsamo, um, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just to add some uh, information about this process, uh, first of all, uh, maybe what was not clear yesterday is because we have a, a total of uh, 16 minor boundary modification requests this year in document 8B add, and eight of them were proposed for approval, and we did not uh, present them, and uh, we went directly for the adoption of the draft decision and we only presented the eight that were not uh, for approval. And in, uh, in terms of the process, uh, uh, what I would just like to add uh, as an important information that we need to really uh, take into consideration the fact that uh, uh, the examination of minor boundary modification uh, happened in a very tight calendar because these are submitted by 1st of February and uh, need to be reviewed uh, within a few weeks. So uh, this is uh, uh, the, the calendar and uh, the space for a dialogue, uh, it's uh, quite uh, limited, but I, I guess that uh, Ecomos already responded on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Balsamo, for your answer. Therefore, we should continue with Ethiopia, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, listening to uh, the debate on this issue and uh, some of the clarification uh, that was given, we are not satisfied that this process is, is, uh, is productive enough the way it is done. I understand the constraint of time, uh, but uh, that cannot be in any case a justification uh, for not having the dialogue. And not having the dialogue is at the root also of understanding that uh, happens and is created and then the antagonistic uh, relationship that often exists between the experts and uh, the state parties. Uh, so I would really urge uh, that we look into this issue in depth to find a way that with a view to, to having this constructive dialogue in place. But that constructive dialogue is not there. Let's, let's not kill ourselves. So really want to change it and have a constructive dialogue. Uh, let's see how the mechanism works. Let's see 
uh, how the deadlines affect uh, or do not affect the existence of this dialogue and what we can do within the rules uh, to make it happen. If it's not possible within the current set of rules, then modify the rules. But the current arrangement, uh, as was clearly highlighted during this uh, debate, uh, is not satisfactory. So we, we wish to see changes in this regard. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much, Ethiopia. Um, your comments have been noted, and um, I think and I feel that uh, it's uh, an ongoing uh, point which has been addressed already. So thank you very much for that, and um, it's been um, noted already. Thank you. Therefore, going back to decision 44-COM-8E, the rapporteur has mentioned that she has not received any amendments. If mm -hmm. okay. I'm sorry for the lapses, Ms. Reporter. Do you have any amendments received for forty four com eight E? Thank you, Mr. Chair. We haven't received any amendments on this draft decision. Therefore, I see no more comments. Therefore, I declare draft decision 44,8E adopted. Thank you. Now I declare item 8E closed. Dear committee members, ladies and gentlemen, the next item on our agenda concern, concerns the upstream process. Please refer to document 9A. As you will remember, by decision 15x.com3, the committee decided that this agenda would be adopted without debate. I therefore invite you to proceed with the adoption of the draft decision 44-COM-9A. But before doing so, I would like to ask the rapporteur if she has received any amendments of the draft decision proposed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We haven't received any amendments on this draft decision. Thank you. Are there any comments? Oman, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I don't have, um, I don't want to open this for debate because it's not for debate, but I would like also clarification. The upstream process versus the preliminary assessment, which is going to, to be discussed tomorrow. I see the process, the process is similar. So to what extent that is going to, to burden, I mean, the process, both the upstream process and the the new um, decision that we're going to, to discuss tomorrow, the preliminary assessment, which is also compulsory. To what extent the process is going to be heavy for both, I mean, the, 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 the um, advisory board, the World Heritage Center and, and member states. I would like cl clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Man. Mr. Balsamo, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you, Oman, for this uh, very pertinent question. Uh, actually, there are lots of similarities uh, between upstream process and uh, preliminary assessment, indeed. But uh, maybe the idea of preliminary assessment uh, uh, has been originated by the success of, of the pressing, uh, upstream process. Uh, but there are actually uh, factual uh, differences. Of course, we are talking about something that already exists in the operational guidelines, the upstream process, and something which is just proposed to integrate the operational guidelines. But uh, uh, there are uh, factual differences in the, in the fact that uh, upstream process is not compulsory, it's a voluntary uh, process. Uh, and uh, uh, while preliminary assessment will be part of the uh, normal nomination process, so it will become a, a mandatory step within the 
uh, that process, uh, and, and there are other uh, also uh, uh, differences uh, which I'm, I'm not going to, to uh, you know, uh, explain uh, because uh, it, it could be a lengthy discussion. But just uh, to say that uh, uh, these two processes, of course, uh, have in, in mind the same idea: is to uh, 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 intervene at an earlier stage, trying to uh, prevent. Uh, later issue with nomination. So in, in this, uh, uh, they are very similar. Uh, in the future, if uh, uh, a preliminary assessment will be uh, one day uh, adopted, as we hope, uh, maybe the upstream process could also uh, change a little bit and uh, be uh, more focused on the revision of uh, uh, tentative list, which are really uh, at the root of uh, what state parties then uh, nominate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Balsamo. Is there any other comment? I see none. Therefore, I declare draft decision 44.9A adopted as amended. This item 9A is now closed. Dear colleagues, dear delegates, we will now deal with the reports of the result of the third cycle of the periodic reporting exercise. As you will remember, due to the ex exceptional circumstances, we will have to examine two reports this year. The final report for the Arab states region, which was due to be presented to you in 2020, and the final report in the Africa region is scheduled for examination in this session 2021. We will therefore start with a report on the results of the third cycle of the periodic reporting exercise in the Arab states. The relevant document is document 10A. But before we start, dear colleagues, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Mr. Valentino Etowar of the World Heritage Center to say a few introductory words on the periodic reporting exercise. Mr. Etowar. You have the floor, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, following the second cycle of, of periodic reporting uh, exercise, a two-year reflection period from 2015 to 2017 was engaged, was secretariat in consultation with advisory bodies, natural and cultural heritage experts from regions, the UNESCO Institute of Statistics, the World Health Center, with the collaboration of the periodic reporting expert group, carry out an extensive and in-depth work to the, develop, to the development of the third cycle questionnaire, which was adopted by the World Heritage Committee at its 41st session. The questionnaire includes notably the integration of sustainable development approach and ask questions that provide information on how the World Heritage properties contribute to environmental sustainable uh, sustainability, inclusive social and economic de development, and synergies with other UNESCO cultural conventions. The third cycle of periodic reporting was officially launched by the World Heritage Committee by decision 41.10a, confirming the start of the reporting period exercise in the Arab states in 2018 and in Africa in 2019. By decisions 41.10a, 42.10a, and 43.10b, the committee has requested the center to engage into a holistic approach across regions in terms of delivery of trainings, tools, and guidance with the idea that this will help to get consistent overall approach across all regions and will further facilitate the state party driven approach of the exercise. In the report that will be presented in the items 10A and 10B, respectively, for Arab states and Africa regions, this request and recommendation has been fully integrated, and the Secretariat has ensured that the streamlined structure of the reports across region, while fully considered of each region specificity. The new monitoring indicators framework structured around six core thematic areas, namely state of conservation, synergies, 
management, sustainable development, capacity development, and governance has been considered in the data analysis and preparation of the regional reports and the preparation of regional action plan. The use of these indicators aims to provide and analyze data on evolution on different aspects of the implementation of the convention across cycles. Finally, Mr. Chair, we would like to point out that the preparation of the third cycle report and regional action plan for the Arab states and Africa were made in very close consultation with the state parties, national focal point, and site managers. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Etowar. Thanks for this very useful comments and words. Now allow me, dear colleagues, to give the floor to Mrs. May Shire, Chief of the Arab State Unit of the World Heritage Center, who will present to us this report. Please, Madam Shire, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The complete, may I have the presentation, please? The complete report on the results of the third cycle of periodic reporting exercise in the Arab states can be found in document WHC slash 21 slash 44 com slash 10A. A quick words on the background. Uh, next slide, please. Since the adoption of the periodic reporting by the World Heritage Committee, the first cycle was undertaken in the region in 1998-1999, and the report was presented to the committee at its 24th session in 2000. The second cycle was undertaken in 2008-2009, and the report was presented to the committee at its 34th session in 2010. The third cycle was undertaken in 2018-2019, the report was initially supposed to be presented at the 44th session in 2020, and it has been postponed for this year. And it is the report that is presented today. Next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, the third cycle was launched in 2018, following decision 41-COM-10A. At the time of initiating the exercise, 83 properties inscribed on the list were invited to participate. The exercise was coordinated by the World Heritage Center in very close collaboration with the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage, which is the Category 2 Center in Bahrain. As a self-reporting process that is led as far as possible by the state's parties, the relevant questionnaire was submitted by the focal points and site managers in the respective state's parties. Close collaboration was also undertaken with the advisory bodies to the committee the UNESCO field offices and heritage experts. Next, please. In terms of the key steps, I would just like to mention that several activities were undertaken to facilitate the process. Following an information session that was organized during the World Heritage Committee's 42nd session in 2018, two meetings were organized for World Heritage uh, uh, National Focal Points, one in Manama in 2018 and another one in Paris in 2019. These were followed by meetings for site managers in Cairo and Manama. Additionally, a side event was organized at the 43rd session of the committee in Baku in 2019. Next, please. By July 2019, the third cycle questionnaire was submitted by all state parties. It comprised two sections, section one, focusing on the implementation of the convention at the national level, and section two, focusing on its implementation at each World Heritage property. All 19 state parties have submitted section one of the questionnaire. For 82 out of the three, 83 invited uh, properties, section two was submitted. This comprised 74 cultural properties, five natural and three mixed properties. Next slide, please. The statistical results and information that was submitted by the state's parties were then analyzed at the scale of the region as a whole. Based on the outcomes of the compiled data, a draft action plan priorities were outlined. In July 2020, an online meeting was held for two days for all focal points and site managers, during which the preliminary outcomes and draft action plan were presented and discussed, and subsequently finalized. The draft action plan was then shared with all focal points by email in March 2021. Next, please. 
I will now uh, present some of the main outcomes. Uh, due to the time constraints, it will not be possible to, pre to present everything, but just uh, some of the few uh, highlights. As reported by the respondents, the number of properties with seriously impacted uh, OUV has risen from one during the second cycle in 2010 to seven in 2019. Overall, the number of properties with impacted OUV has almost doubled from 11 to 20 properties. This increase may be attributed to the complex situation that has faced several cultural properties during the past years. Nevertheless, as reported by states parties, the situation is either being addressed or can be addressed. In terms of factors affecting properties, it seems that those falling under local conditions affecting physical fact, uh, fabric, such as humidity, water, uh, flooding, and so on, have been rated as having the highest current potential negative impact on properties. Other factors with high negative impact are related to climate change and severe weather events, social and cultural uses of heritage, which includes also tourism, management and institutional factors, and other human activities. Uh, the latter uh, comprise actions such as the uh, destruction of heritage uh, and so on. It is noteworthy that concerns related to local climatic conditions, climate change, and severe weather events have been reflected as well in some of the identified priorities for capacity building. In addition, the exercise has highlighted very clearly the impact of conflicts on the capacity of some state parties to effectively protect and conserve heritage. Next slide, please. As regards protection, boundaries and buffer zones have been identified as main management needs in, term of, in terms of delineation and communication with local community and communities and landowners. Boundary delineation and buffer zones are indeed a priority given uh, the need for several boundary clarifications in the region. Since the second cycle, there has been an increase in the number of properties with management plans or management systems, which is a very uh, good thing. Nevertheless, for several properties, management plans are only partially implemented. In addition, a number, a number uh, of properties with formal monitoring programs has not increased. The objectives of the World Heritage Committee, uh, according to the results, the extent to which the management system contributes to achieving the objectives of the uh, policy for the integration of sustainable development perspectives is very uh, limited. Next slide, please. Moving on to synergies. Uh, Achieving synergies with other conventions, programs, and recommendations was among the top 10 priorities identified by state parties. Priority themes under synergies were found in relation to the use of the 1972 UNESCO recommendation, as well as the 2011 recommendation on the historic urban landscape. There are positive levels of energy, uh, synergy between the World Heritage Convention and other instruments and programs in terms of ratifications and communication. As regards natural properties, the highest levels of co cooperation are in relation to the Ramsar Convention and the Man and Biosphere Program. However, in relation to the second protocol of the 1954 Convention, this does not seem to be the case for cultural properties, although substantial interest has been expressed in that regard. The results also show that the 2011 recommendation is the most followed document at 74%, and this is at the level of uh, the state parties, at the national level, in comparison with the policy document on the impact of climate change and the strategy for reducing risks from disasters. However, at the property level, only 30% of these properties are making use of the 2011 recommendation. Nevertheless, the use of this recommendation, the climate change policy, and the disaster risk strategy were identified among the top priority uh, management needs. Um, next slide, please. In terms of capacity uh, development, it is noteworthy that capacity building was selected by 15 out of the 19 state parties as a priority. 13 state parties also selected the use of the World Heritage Capacity Building Strategy as a priority uh, main theme. More specifically, 
the highest rated capacity building needs are related to conservation and management, sustainable development, risk preparedness and disaster risk uh, reduction, statutory processes, and the development of inclusive, equitable, and effective management systems. For cultural sites, management approaches and methodologies, including the historic urban landscape, was also rated highly, while for natural heritage, the protection and integration of biological and cultural diversity was rated highly. Next slide, please. Uh, as regards sustainable development, sustainable development, it also came out as a, as a, a major priority for the regions. Themes such as sustainable tourism have been highlighted as priority with a need for strategic planning in addition to training. In terms of contribution of inscriptions in achieving the objectives of the World Heritage Sustainable Development Policy and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the highest scores were for protecting environmental and cultural diversity and ecosystem services and benefits, as well as for promoting economic investment and quality tourism. On the other hand, in terms of the contribution to protection of heritage during conflict and to conflict recovery, this scored slightly higher than the contrib contribution to ensuring conflict prevention and promoting conflict resolution. In any case, those two uh, uh, areas were rated uh, the lowest. As for the effective integration of conservation and protection of cultural and natural heritage as an element in national sustainable uh, development policies and strategy, the policy areas with the highest uh, level of integration are related to respecting and consulting and involve, involving indigenous peoples and local communities, as well as promoting economic investment and quality uh, tourism. Again, the, the contribution to promoting economic investment and quality tourism was rated highly in both uh, questions. Um, again, the lowest ratings were related to conflict prevention, resolution, and recovery, uh, as well as strengthening resilience to natural hazards. With regards to communities, consider considerable efforts are being made, as reported by state parties, to give heritage a function in the lives of communities, whether according to a strategy or on an ad hoc basis, but less so in relation to participatory approaches. Next, please. Other outcomes are related, obviously, to financial status and human resources, which were a priority for most state parties. Concerning policy and resources, having a national capacity building strategy was selected as a high priority theme. Institutional capacities to conduct research specifically for world heritage was also an identified priority. The promotion of international cooperation and the establishment of cooperation mechanisms for heritage was a main priority theme selected by 14 state parties out of uh, 19. As for education, awareness raising priority themes focus on strategies to raise awareness among communities and stakeholders, in addition to heritage awareness programs for children and youth. Heritage ed education programs were also identified as a priority management need at the level of uh, the properties uh, themselves. Uh, finally, uh, there was a focus also on tentative lists and uh, there was great uh, interest uh, that was expressed in using the upstream process. Although very few state parties um, expressed that the, the, the upstream process has been used. Nevertheless, there was a very great interest in this uh, process. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so, based on the results and the outcomes of, of uh, the periodic reporting exercise at the regional level, uh, a draft action plan was established, which is more of, a, of an overall framework based on analysis and outcomes. Although at the time of filling the questionnaire, COVID-19 had not yet emerged, during the meeting, the online meeting of July 2020, participants highlighted the impact of the pandemic on tourism and consequently the livelihoods of communities 
and therefore the need for alternative sustainable solutions was raised raised, and this was highlighted uh, in the action plan itself. The proposed action plan is envisaged for the coming six years and comprises a set of actions. Where applicable, the monitoring indicators for each action have been selected among the monitoring indicators that have been adopted for the third cycle at the global level. The action plan framework is based on three strategic objectives and two transversal thematic priorities. The, the two thematic priorities are cross-cutting among the three objectives. The first uh, thematic priority is in regards to strengthening capacities for the protection, conservation, and management of world heritage. And the second one is in relation to enhancing participation and engagement of all stakeholders, particularly local communities, fostering education and awareness raising. Next slide, please. Uh, each strategic objectives ha uh, objective has a set of uh, actions. Uh, the first one is to contribute to a representative and balanced World Heritage List in the Arab state, reflecting the cultural and nat natural diversity in the region. And this includes uh, actions such as uh, support in or capacity building in training uh, for the preparation of tentative list, uh, uh, nominations, it, it, it includes the actions that have already, you know, in the process or have been carried out in terms of uh, gap analysis, needs assessments, and so on. The second strategic objective is to enhance the protection, conservation, and management of world heritage, particularly for sites inscribed on the list of world heritage in danger, including through emergency preparedness, risk disaster response, and planning for recovery. And this is a theme that uh, was uh, very strongly recurring in, in the online meeting that uh, took place in 2020, as well as another specific meeting that was for sites uh, on the danger list. The third uh, objective is to improve the integration of sustainable development policies in the management of World Heritage Site. And this uh, obviously includes uh, addressing uh, policies uh, related to sustainable uh, development, integrating them in management uh, plans, um, seeking alternative uh, solutions to livelihoods uh, of communities uh, affected, you know, especially, you know, in, in uh, recent, uh, in the past two years by COVID and so on. In conclusion, the third, uh, next, the, the third cycle of periodic reporting has been generally well received by the participants in the region. Suggestions were provided on the need for further clarification and training. As a self-reporting mechanism, uh, it has succeeded in providing an overall view of the implementation of the com convention in the region with insights into the conservation and management of the properties. It has provided also a platform for exchange of information and experiences. Monitoring indicators have been included in the report for the first time. For some questions, it has been feasible to measure change since the second cycle. While for several other questions, this has not been possible due to changes made to the questionnaire itself. Nevertheless, the monitoring indicators form a baseline to measure progress in the future. Next slide. The next steps. Following the dissemination of the report and action plan, online information meetings will be organized in order to uh, discuss with uh, focal points and site managers the way forward. State parties, are, state parties are invited to appropriate the action plan and decide on the actions that would be relevant for, their, for implementation by the respective authorities. The World Heritage Center will monitor and follow up the implementation of the action plans with state parties. Subject to funding availability, support may be provided in the implementation of priority action by the World Heritage Center and partners and the advisory bodies, of course, and the Arab Region Center uh, for World Heritage and other uh, partners. To monitor progress achieved in implementing the action plan, a mid-cycle assessment is proposed in the form of a very short and straightforward um, survey. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, to close uh, the presentation, uh, we would like to extend our deep gratitude to all state parties in the region 
the World Heritage Focal Points and Site Managers for their active participation in the implementation of the exercise. Their invaluable inputs provided insight into the implementation of the World Heritage Convention as well as information about the factors affecting the properties and the challenges that they face. Our gratitude goes to the state parties of Bahrain and Egypt for kindly hosting training workshops. Sincere appreciation goes to the Arab Region Center for World Heritage for their continued active support and commitment throughout the implementation of the third cycle in the Arab states. Our appreciation is also extended to the advisory bodies and experts, as well as the UNESCO field offices in the region and the UNESCO Institute of Statistics. Next, please. The draft decision of this item can be found on page 107 of the English version and 116 of the French version. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I understand that ECOMOS would like to take the floor on behalf of the advisory bodies, if possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chair, for this um, great report and uh, your input in this process. Thank you very much. Yes, ECOMOS, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chair. And as my Chair has just indicated, this statement is made on behalf of all three advisory bodies, ICOMOS, ICROM and IUCN. ICOMOS, ICROM and IUCN congratulate the state parties of the Arab states region for the completion of the third cycle of periodic reporting in collaboration with the Secretariat. The periodic reporting process has been an important collective effort of focal points of state parties, site managers, the Arab Regional Centre for World Heritage, heritage organisations and professionals from the region. The process has facilitated exchanges and collaboration, as well as capacity building opportunities for and among state parties, demonstrating the importance of the exercise beyond just reporting on improved cooperation. The advisory bodies acknowledge that state parties have taken steps to enhance the representation of the diverse natural and cultural heritage from the Arab states region on the World Heritage List. These steps include elaboration of inventories at the national level and actions at the regional level by the Arab Regional Centre for World Heritage. The advisory bodies note that the direct and indirect impacts of conflicts continue to affect the capacity of some state parties to protect and conserve heritage in this region. For certain properties on the list of World Heritage in Danger, where reactive monitoring missions have not been possible owing to conflict situations, the advisory bodies have contributed to innovative collaborative pilot projects to support states' parties. Aside from conflicts, over the last eight years, many other factors are negatively affecting world heritage in the region, including management, housing, land conversion, legal frameworks, illegal activities, waste management, climate change, overfishing, transport infrastructure and tourism. These factors suggest the need for greater transnational collaboration, strengthening governance, improved use of the statement of outstanding universal value for management purposes, and better use of available instruments and policies. These include, for example, the forthcoming World Heritage Impact Assessment guidance that will be issued later this year. The action plan provides measurable objectives and accompanying actions, particularly important in the advisory body's view are the thematic priorities. That is, strengthening capacities in the protection, conservation and management of world heritage, enhancing participation and engagement of all stakeholders, particularly local communities, and fostering education and awareness building. ICOMOS, ICROM and IUCN are committed to supporting the state parties from the Arab states region, both regionally and individually, and with organizations active in the region. The joint regional study by the Arab Regional Centre for World Heritage and ICOMOS is specifically directed at improving representation on the World Heritage List. The ICOMOS collaboration with the Arab Regional Centre for World Heritage also covered training activities on the World Heritage Convention and related policy documents. IUCN has also collaborated with the Arab Regional Centre for World Heritage on the preparation of the third edition of the Tabea series of publications on natural world heritage 
and is engaged in strengthening the partnership with the regional center through a new memorandum of understanding and five-year action plan in conjunction with the IUCN offices in the region. ICROM through its regional office in Sharjah will also continue to work with state parties within its activities and programs in the region on key issues of conservation for World Heritage properties. Through all of these various activities of the advisory bodies in the region, the results of the third cycle of periodic reporting will support endeavours towards meeting identified priority needs and implementing the action plan. The advisory bodies thank all actors involved in periodic reporting for the results achieved and for the collaborative process that has been put in place to implement this important statutory process of the World Heritage Convention. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Ikomos. Now I would like to open the floor for comments before we move to the examination of the draft decision. I would like to know if you want to make any comments on this matter. Please raise your hand. So we have Oman. Oman, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I would like to start by thanking the Secretariat and the advisory body for all the efforts they are making in the Arab world to protect and to build the capacity for the member states. Um, the report is, is thorough. I have gone through the report and I would like to pick one point here, which is frequently mentioned during the presentation of the Arab desk at the World Heritage Center, and that's the capacity building. And whatever we do for the capacity building, all the efforts, thanks to the World Heritage Center and the advisory body, um, and different uh, regional and sub-regional uh, offices, we still need more. We still ask for more capacity building because capacity building is the main, I think, for this World Heritage Sites and for building the capacity of men, uh, member states. Things is changing also in the process and in knowledge. And therefore, I think the dissemination of knowledge to member states is very important. I would like to suggest for the World Heritage Center and its bodies, that we, we start to develop training kits. Training, training kits for each theme that is just mentioned and is need for all member states is very important. I think now we need to change also the, the, the strategy and, and how we do things, and that is to start using the, the cascading model or training the trainer. I think training two or three people in a, a sub-regional or a regional conference or, or, or a workshop is not enough. And therefore, I think it's very important now to start building um, uh, training kits and we train trainers inside each country. And then we update the trainers and these trainers in each country, they do their work in their, in the, in their, in their country. This is very important, I think, to build the capacity because build, building capacity of at a regional or a sub-regional, sending two or three due to, to, to financial constraint is not enough. And they are, we think we are thankful to them, but we ask for more, and that is to start using this cascading model for training the trainers for in each country. The second point I, I would like to raise is protecting cultural heritage in countries of crisis. And I think here we, we need in this region, the World Heritage Center and its body to, to, to mini, um, maximize their effort in, in this side. I think our, our countries in, in Syria, in Yemen, in, in Libya, in Iraq, etc., we need more effort. And therefore, the effort is made. I, I don't want to, 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 um, uh, to minimize the effort, but I think we need to, max, to maximize the effort of the um, World Heritage Center and the advisory board. I thank you. Thank you, Oman. Thank you for keeping up with the time as well. Bahrain, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Since the adoption of the World Heritage Committee's decision 41-COM 10A and the subsequent launch of the third cycle of periodic reporting in the Arab states in 2018, the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage based in Bahrain was fully engaged with the World Heritage Center advisory bodies, Arab states focal points and site managers in completing the third cycle of periodic reporting. In this regard, the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage was mobilized during the entire duration of the process between 2018 and 2020 providing technical and financial assistance to Arab states by facilitating and organizing regional meetings and workshops in cooperation with the World Heritage Center Arab States Unit. As the first category two center under the auspices of UNESCO, 
to collaborate in the implementation of the periodic reporting, the Arab Regional Center for Road Heritage played a major role and did not refrain from spending any efforts to be an active partner of UNESCO in the region for the effective implementation of the periodic reporting. This fruitful collaboration would not have been possible without the support of the Arab States Unit and the Policy and Statutory Meetings Unit of the World Heritage Center, advisory bodies, and the dedication of Arab States focal points and site managers. We would like, on behalf of Bahrain, to express our gratitude and thanks to them all. Thank you. Thank you, Bahrain, for your remarks. Now, Egypt, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. I would like also to thank uh, the World Heritage Center for preparing this report on the third cycle of the periodic reporting exercise in the Arab State region, as well as uh, thanking the center for its uh, outstanding performance in organizing the different uh, related activities, including uh, the activity that uh, we were honored to host in Cairo. Uh, this periodic reporting exercise is an important tool for the 1972 convention. It identifies gaps in the implementation. We concur with previous speakers and also with what was mentioned in the report regarding the priorities uh, for the region, uh, namely the capacity building, the international cooperation, and also the general policy development. We welcome the adoption of the draft decision, and we express our full readiness to continue uh, the ongoing cooperation with the World Heritage Center and the advisory bodies to realize the implementation of the third cycle action plan and its strategic objectives. Finally, Mr. Chair, I would like uh, to express all our gratitude, our thanks to the World Heritage Center and also to Madame Maishwair, the director of uh, the Arab Unions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Egypt, for your comments as well. <clears throat> Ikram, you have the floor, please. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And sorry, I'll be very brief in this. Uh, I just want to respond to the distinguished delegate from Oman uh, when he was talking about the idea of um, creating, he called them training kits, let's say. But I, I just wanted to go back and say that at the end of the first cycle of periodic reporting uh, in the early 2000s, um, ECROM and IUCN developed a series of modules uh, for training specifically for the Arab states region. Um, and I think his idea is a very good one. And I would like to uh, offer ECROM's uh, potential services along with other capacity building uh, institutions in the region uh, on the possibility of maybe taking those, mo those original modules that we built up 15 years ago and maybe turning them into something a little bit more substantial as he's outlined in his, in his intervention. So I just wanted to, to put that on the table as a possibility for the future. And we would be happy to talk to Oman and other states parties uh, to work on the development. Thank you. Thank you, Ikram. Now I would like to ask Ms. Sher to answer um, and comment of, of the previous interventions. Please, Ms. Sher, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, uh, we definitely agree with the uh, com comments uh, from uh, the distinguished delegate uh, of Amer um, Oman, uh, from the committee member uh, of Oman and the other committee members of Bahrain and Egypt. Um, definitely capacity building is very important uh, for us and the region in the coming uh, period. We have already also started uh, translating, um, we, you know, as a center, secretariat and also the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage, translating a, a number of uh, documents and guidance notes into the Arabic language. Uh, the idea of having kids uh, is, is a very um, good idea and also uh, training of training, uh, trainers. We are also um, started with the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage, also compiling the lists of experts in the region. The region has a large number of experts, however, um, somehow it seems to be dispersed and so on. So we are trying to consolidate uh, this and also the idea of training tra trainers um, is good, hopefully, for the future. Um, we thank uh, Bahrain again and the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage and we hope that uh, we will uh, continue to cooperate with you in the implementation of the, the, the next uh, st steps. Um, also thank you Egypt for, uh, for um, agreeing also to the priorities that have been outlined and which really reflect uh, the gaps that have been identified by all state parties. 
Um, uh, we look really forward to working uh, with the region. Um, implementing the action plan and a lot of action would need uh, substantial resources. We will try to do whatever we can within our capacity, and we look forward to your support and kind co cooperation as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Chair, again. Um, I see no more comments. Then I will invite you to examine and adopt draft decision 44.10a, included in document 10a. But before doing so, I would like to ask the rapporteur if she has received any amendments of the draft decision proposed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We haven't received any amendments on this draft decision. Thank you. Are there any more comments or questions? I see none. Therefore, I declare draft decision 44.10a adopted. Your colleagues and delegates, item 10a is of our agenda is now closed. Now let's move on to item 10b. Dear colleagues and delegates, now we have concluded the examination of the final periodic report of the Arab States region. We will now listen to the presentation of the report on the third cycle of periodic reporting exercise in Africa, which is contained in document 10B. I would like to give the floor to Mrs. Muhammad Juma Muhammad, Chief of the Africa Unit of the World Heritage Center, who will introduce this item. Mr. Muhammad, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. As our, I will start to represent the report of uh, Africa region on periodic reporting exercise. This report is uh, in document whc slash 21 slash 44.com slash 10b. Next slide, please. Distinguished uh, committee member, I will not go to the details of background which my colleagues Valentino has explained in terms of procedures, both Arab units and Arab, Arab region and Africa, U, Ar Africa region who have followed the same kind of procedures, following the same uh, recommendations of uh, operational guidelines. But here I just wanted to emphasize maybe two points, that in Africa regions, the decision of foot one com 10a that was decided that was the one decided to initiate this process in 2019 and the decision of uh, report for africa is found in decision 43 coms 10b thank you next slide please now when it comes to african regions as we are now in the 30 30 cycles we had of course other two cycles in the fire cycle for Africa started 1999 uh, until uh, 2000, and uh, this report was examined in 20, 2001. And these slides, distinguished committee member, we just wanted to emphasize that you can see there's important kind of progress, though of course, when it comes to Africa, issue of representativity is still critical, but you can see here from the first cycle to the third cycle, there is, when it comes to properties, we have at least 140% kind of uh, increase. And to the state party, when we start the first cycle in 2019, there are only 18 state parties in Africa. And now with this study cycle, we can see we have 46 state party, so the increase of 155%. But since, the 20, since the 2020, all African state party all African member states now are the state parties to this convention, with the last one was Somalia. So this was just kind of a brief introduction to show you the trend from the first to the third uh, cycle. Next, please. This process was long, and for us, it, has, uh, it had uh, some impact. I will talk about that later on, COVID, because we started in the middle of COVID, 
But with this slide, I just wanted to, to highlight what important actors who are really participating in this, uh, in this uh, exercise. As you remember, distinguished uh, committee members, in 20, it was decided in 2017 that this process will be state party driven process. So the, in the center of the process was the national focal point. Who are the key point on this? Because they are the representative for, for the government in this uh, convention. And the other important stakeholders was site managers, who are very, very key in this. But uh, advisor body, they were accompanying us in all exercise. As you all aware that uh, periodic reporting exercise is also a moment of capacity building. So advisor body, they took this uh, important uh, moment to train our site manager and to train also focal point. But as this was state party driven exercise, the most important actor was, of course, African Watershed Fund. African Watershed Fund, the one who mobilized with state party and coordinate all process of African, of periodic reporting exercise in Africa. But for us also, civil society and local community were part of the process, and I will indicate later on how they participate in this process. Of course, UNESCO field office, because they are the one who are very close with site managers national focal point. They were very close with this uh, in the process. Us in the center, of course, we just help them and coordinate all of the activity for this uh, exercise. Next, please. <clears throat> for Africa, I can say the process itself started in February 2019 where there was a preparatory workshop in uh, South Africa, and it was in South Africa because, as you know, the World Heritage Center, World, I mean, African Water Fund is in South, South Africa. So it organized this uh, workshop just to mobilize all stakeholders, but to come up with a kind of a procedures or kind of a methodology how to initiate this uh, process in Africa. Following that, the first Workshop was organized in uh, Cote d'Ivoire in September 2019. During this uh, workshop, eight, two participants participated in this, of course, with a 41 national focal point. All representative of our uh, advisory body, as they say, participated in this. And of course, coordination team. <clears throat> I'll talk about coordination team later on. But one of the important procedures in Africa, which was decided, of course, with State Party, with the support of uh, African Water Fund, was to have a coordinating coordination team of five members from all region in Africa to support State Party in doing this. So this was a very, very important meeting where national focus point were trained, were trained how to manage the whole process. Because as you know, in the questionnaire, the first part of the questionnaire, which is filled by national focal point, but the second part is filled by site manager, but and then within the state part, within the country, national focal point, they are the important one. They are the one who are coordinating all site managers. So this was extremely important workshop. The second one was the first workshop for Anglophone site manager, which was uh, undertook in, uh, in Kenya in February 2020s. During this uh, workshop, seven five site managers from Anglophone country participated. Coordination team, all coordination team participated as well. Advisory body also participated and stakeholders also participated. During <clears throat> our previous program was that following the workshop in February, we were supposed to have another workshop in March 2020. But as you remember, as you recall, starting from December, the COVID situation started to be very important along the world. And from March, we were not able to travel. So, and everything was supposed to be online. So from this moment, the Africa region and the, the center, we decided to come up with new strategy. We didn't stop, but we say we wanted to continue. We decided to come up with a new strategy. Next. So what, what were the <coughs> new strategies? As you know, we come from what we call presential, but classical way of doing meeting and suddenly we were supposed to go to online way of doing meeting. And at that time, today is normally that everyone is talking through, through Zooms and uh, Teams and WhatsApp, WhatsApp was not there. But at that time, it was still something new, especially to other parts of the world, this was some, completely something new. So what we did at the first is to do survey. 
to do survey to understand the position of site manager and national focal point and countries, how they are in terms of going online. What were the gaps? What were the things which were, were needed? So we did like a hundred kind of questionnaire. I mean, hundred. Uh, we send this question to like hundred experts and uh, and the site manager, national focal point in Africa to understand uh, to understand the, the, the situation. So following this survey, our idea was the conclusion was to go to target each site individual. We cannot go with the, with, the, with the procedure as it was before to put everyone on one, uh, on one packet and have one meeting. So it was extremely difficult, but we, we decided to go with it. So it was like target process. Each site manager has a unique situation. Some of them they have an internet connection. Some of them they didn't have internet connection. Some of them they were very close to the center in, in the capital where we could bring them to our office. Some of them they were very far from those areas. So we decided to took completely new approach of targeted go site manager by site manager, national focal point by site national focal point, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the country by country. This one, to achieve this one, we had decided to have weekly meeting to monitor the process. So every week we monitor, we understand which one has an issue, which one has a problem. And we divided the process, in fact, in three stages. The country which was above 50, the country which was below 50, and we concentrate our energy to the country which were below 50. So it was tedious work, but we were very happy on this. And then we also focus our exercise to Francophone and Lusophone country, which at that time in March, we were not able to organize our meeting. Next, please. And we were very happy today to say that we have achieved 100% of our work. So section one, which was done by National Focal, Focal Point, they fill questionnaire, all of them, and they submitted them by 100%. Site managers, with all difficulty that they have, some of them in area where there was no connectivity, we had to telephone them. We, I, I remember some of my colleagues in the afternoon, it was the time to talk with the site manager and to help them to understand which, which were the difficulties. But we were very happy that with all of that tedious work, the result was with us. So we have achieved 100% in Africa. Next, please. Following that, of course, we have now a questionnaire which was filled, but and then the questionnaire and the, and the result doesn't tell us anything. Now we wanted to come to another point, and this is extremely important for us, how to analyze the data. And we come up with the idea of creating kind of, uh, I can say, dialectic, because those questionnaires, they were filled with national focal point and they were filled with site manager. Those are the people who are working day to day with those sites. But once we have those uh, report, we decided to took this report to experts from Africa. And in here we are experts and uh, other stakeholders, community, they were involved. We give them this result, we say, look, this is what expert and national point, focal point they are saying when it comes to management, capacity building, when it comes to heritage, how do you see about this? So experts, they analyze those, uh, those materials and they give us like report, synthetic report. But following that, we took those reports and we sent back again to site manager national focal point. So we create like synthetic, like dialectic between experts who are kind of analyzing and uh, talking about the site and site managers who are working day to day. So for, for us, this kind of cross-cutting knowledge and experience was very, very important to see how these two groups, they see heritage in Africa and how they wanted to, to do it. So following that, we organized for workshop in all sub region in Africa to talk with all site managers to show them that their result, to show them the analysis of expert and community regarding what they are doing and to let them now look at those two kind of knowledge and go another step. So following that site manager, they went further step. Looking at the result, look at the analysis, now they wanted to produce actions which they, we think they'll fit to, to respond to those kind of analysis and the, the, the questionnaire. Following the four meetings with site managers, we went again to do a meeting with a national focal point to look at all those kind of process and of course to kind of finalize the process. So in February 2021, 
we had a final uh, consultation meeting with the national focal point to look at the result and to look at the objective, to look at the action of the process. Next, please. Now, if we look at uh, the results, and here is, I wanted to, to also to talk about one important element that my colleague uh, uh, Valentina talking about, which was uh, initiated in this third process, you know, the third, I mean, uh, third uh, periodic reporting exercise was monitoring. And monitoring was extremely important for us because it allowed us to do comparison between the two cycles, from the second cycle and the third cycle. So when it comes to outstanding universal value, you can see here distinguished members that we were able to, to see the situation from the third and, and the second cycle. And we can say that there is an improvement. If you look at the third cycle, the maintenance, the third, the, how, if you ask a site manager how they maintain the OEV in, in, the, in the second cycle, the statistics show that it was around 67%, but now in the third cycle, we were in 76%. And if you look at the serious impact at that time, we were around 4%, now we are 3%. So we can say that there is an improvement on maintaining OUV of outstanding universal value for this site. Next, please. But this indicator, there were also enable us to look at regions by self, how regions, they are kind of implementing tools. So for example, when it comes to 2011 historical urban landscape tools, we could see that the difference between, uh, between, uh, between uh, heritage, between uh, regions, how they implement it. But also when it comes to climate change also, we could see for, for this side, we could see that there were some kind of uh, different between region, but this is also help us to target capacity buildings because of this indicator. So we know that in some region, they do better when it comes to certain tools, in certain region, they do do better. So we will focus when it comes to our, 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 our action plan and capacity building. Next, please. Here also, we wanted to show also one of the important uh, indicators which give us kind of uh, see how regions, they are looking at the uh, issue of climate change, and you can see that southern region, the importance of the impact of climate change, and this is, you can vividly see from their, from their answers, and uh, Central Africa also, the issue of climate change, how the impact of climate change. So what I wanted to show here is that these indicators, it also help us to focus and target the, the, the part. Next, please. Issue of capacity building was extremely important on outcome of this uh, third cycle periodic reporting exercise. But as I said, due thanks to these indicators, it also enables to see the difference between second cycle and third cycle. Distinguished members, you can see in front of you here, you have that two cycles. When it comes to capacity building in Africa, they were the same kind of uh, need, we can say, the need on conservation, the need on uh, risk preparedness, the need on promotion, visitor management, education, they were the same. But in third cycle, we were able somehow to go more deep to understand when it comes to conservation, what are the most important issues. When it comes to risk preparedness, what are the important issues. So this information, they will also help us to look in details when it comes to our action plan. Next one, please. Also, when it comes to outcome, we were also able to, to see, when it comes to conservation, the, the, the rates of those uh, countries which are implementing. So we have seen, for example, 33 state party, which is 34% of state party. They are not fully implementing management plans. And we'll also be able to see that uh, nine state party, which is 19% of uh, have uh, an adequate budget, don't have have an adequate budget. So you can see there's a disparity in terms of budget, in terms of management plans. And only 22 out of 96 property have risk management plan. Next, please. When it comes to capacity building, we also wanted to go to deep to see exactly what are the issues, because when you say education and communication is broader, but from this slide, you can see that there are also changes, of course, 16 state part in Africa, which is 34.8, have a national capacity building. But when you go deep, you find that there are still some countries in Africa which doesn't have national 
capacity strategy. For example, here we have six countries which doesn't have. 24 countries have, but it's not well much implemented on it. So this detailed information is very, very important to us when it comes to focusing in our action plan. Next, please. Heritage and uh, education also is very, very important. We have seen that, of course, there is awareness, but when it comes to genders, we have found that uh, there is a really, really relative poor kind of uh, education and communication when it comes to women and youth and local business in Africa. And looking at the, 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 the population of Africa now, and when you see that youth, they don't have so much awareness on this. This is extremely important information which tell us what to do. And of course, we've seen that only two state parties in Africa which have uh, effectively implemented national strategy to raise awareness. So this is, this is the result, the outcome of exercise. Next, please. Of course, stakeholder is extremely important to us when to implement uh, this uh, convention in Africa, but we've seen that only 29% uh, the women are participating when it comes to management and conservation in Africa. This is in extremely important information when we, took, when we look at the uh, demography of Africa. And out of 96, only 25 state party has a framework of inclusive economic development. This is extremely important because we know this debate between conservation and, and, and development. And if we wanted to tackle this kind of challenges, of course, we have to look at this uh, information we have. Next, please. So following all of this information, then we decided to craft, of course, our action plan. In Africa, what I can say, sustainable development was an umbrella of our action plan. We didn't have specific action for sustainable development, but we say that what all whatever we're going to do, it has to be based on sustainable development. But as you know, distinguished committee member, issue of representativity is extremely important of Africa. So our vision is to make that all state parties in Africa, they are represented in this list, but they, were also, they are also empowered and they brand sustainable world heritage system. So representativity that empower African states to use the world heritage system in their sustainable goals. This is, this is the main vision. And if you can see that uh, we have, following this vision, we have crafted five objectives with uh, 26 actions to implement this. By doing this, there were a lot of information, of course, we were not based only in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the questionnaire of uh, site managers, but uh, as you remember, synergy was extremely important when you're doing this uh, periodic reporting exercise, third periodic reporting exercise. So information regarding sustainable development, Gorongoro Declaration, as we said, whole recommendation, UNESCO Global, UNESCO Global Periodic Africa, Africa Union, of course, the 2030 Agenda and Inspiration 5 and Agenda 2030, all of these were for us information that we wanted to take in board when we are doing this uh, exercise and in formulating action in Africa. Next, please. Now I just want to go quickly to this uh, strategic, strategic objective and the actions. I will just focus on those uh, flagship action on this, uh, on this, uh, on this uh, strategic objective. For example, if we go to strategic objective one, which has four action, the most important action for us was, of course, nomination to make sure that African state party, they are developing what we call credible nomination. But the, the target is for those 12 countries which doesn't have any nomination, doesn't have any property yet. So if you look at uh, action three and action four, you can see that those are the, our, our targets. To do that, of course, we will develop tentative lists, but also thematic studies that will help African state party to understand which area now they can develop. Now we are developing modern heritage of Africa. We think it will be extremely important thematic study that will help us to have more nomination in Africa. Next, please. For second strategic ob objective, which with the uh, 11 action, this is the most important objective, which has 11 actions. And we know here what the most important, of course, is, cons is conservation. But we know that uh, those sites which are already in World Heritage in Gender List, they are also important. So what we'll do here is to develop this OCR for all sites which are in Gender List in Africa. And our target is that by 2023, we have all 15 sites, all 11 sites, which in Gender List doesn't have a strategy for this OCR, 
to develop them. So this is very, very important. Of course, disaster and risk preparedness is also important for us. Next, please. Strategic objection number three, of course, we are talking about developing capacity building, and this is extremely, extremely important, as it has already been alluded a little bit with my colleague uh, from Arab state. In Africa region also, capacity building is, has become extremely important. But for Africa now, what we said, we want a little bit to change the, to change the, to change the, I can say the, the approach. So now, flagship action plan, this, this objective has four action plan. But we really wanted to encourage kind of mentorship. And to do that, we have already developed what we call the roster for experts in Africa. We have roster which show now we have uh, at least 150 experts in Africa which have already kind of uh, put themselves in this roster for expertise. And we have also youth and women on this. So we, is, we are now developing pilot until December. Following that, from next year, we'll go full ship full freeing to this uh, mentorship program to make sure that Africa has become sufficient in, in, this, uh, in this area. But also the, another important uh, activity for this to establish, of course, Africa Site Manager Network to enhance this uh, exchange of knowledge and, and experience. Next, please. When it comes to enhance education, one of the flagship uh, action that we'll take is to create this uh, network of universities to make sure that now the emphasis on capacity building is not only to site manager and those experts, but it also go to university. So developing curriculum to education is extremely important and that will be flagship action in this objective number five. Next, please. Objective number five is of course community. We also wanted to, as we say, that uh, the role of women in terms of uh, management and communication was very weak and we wanted to enhance this. So of course, mapping will map in the engagement of community and make sure that uh, women and youth and in indigenous people, they are fully participating in, uh, in uh, management and conservation of uh, sites in, in Africa. Next, please. So following, you are following the, the, these action plans, the step will follow, following the committee endorsement of this action plan, one important thing we'll do, of course, to disseminate this uh, to our site managers and the uh, national focal point. So we'll organize a regional meeting on action plan to disseminate this. Of course, we'll also publish it for, the, for our stakeholders also to know about, know more about, uh, about this action plan. We'll also engage with state parties. This is for us extremely important to make sure that this action plan for the, six, for the coming six years is also become part of national and uh, local level planning because by just keeping it separately, we have seen one of the gap of our second cycle periodic reporting exercise is that it was not very well funded. So the, for this time, we wanted to make sure we'll mobilize that party to make sure that this become na part of our national and local development plan. Of course, as has been said also to our colleagues from Arab state, for us also mobilizing resource, it will be extremely, extremely important because these six years is very short. If we cannot mobilize resources, it will be very difficult. Of course, Secretariat will do its part, but we also will be very happy for our stakeholders and other member states to help us on this. Also, we, we will follow some of the activity from Second Cycle, which are very, very important, which have already set, initiated it. Some of pilot on uh, mentoring and uh, networking of our site manager that will follow, but we'll also do assessment in terms of understanding that how far we are. So we'll have an annually meeting with national focal point to do assessment of our implementation. Next, please. Although there was success, I can say we were very happy to achieve 100% of this uh, third cycle implementation exercise, but this work was done with many stakeholders, with many actors, so I wanted just to acknowledge and thank them. We wanted to thank stakeholders for their support, national focal point, they were instrumental, site managers. We know that they had had the time to shift from presential to online meeting, but they were with us and we were very happy that we have achieved. So I wanted also to thank them. African Watch had this fund. They were the, I can say, instrumental in terms of process. They are regional teams. As I say, one of the approach in Africa was to 
to construct these teams of five mentors. And I wanted to, Chairman, I wanted to mention their names here because they've done very important, important work to make sure that we have achieved 100%. So the regional coordinator was Madame Ishan Ilonso from Nigeria. We had a, a mentor from uh, Mauritius, Corinne Forest, Musawa from Zambia, Charles Akibode from Kabevade, and Joseph Mafinga from uh, DRC. Those are our mentors who have uh, helped us. We want also to thank the authority of Cote d'Ivoire and uh, Kenya for hosting the two sub-regions we were able to do before COVID. But also we wanted to thank some government, which also has helped us to implement this uh, second cycle uh, exercise, which is also has been give us some indication on what should we do and what can we do in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in third cycle. We have mentioned this in our, in our draft decision, but I wanted to mention here, thank to the government of China, Belgium, Flanders, France, Japan, Netherlands, Norway, Sultan of Oman, and European Union for their contribution on second cycle and some of the activity that definitely will carry on on third cycle when I say, when I, when I talk to mentoring. Next, please. Thank you very much, distinguished committee member for your attention. Thank you very much, Chair. And as I understand, Chair, advisor body, they also wanted to comment today to say something on the, this exercise in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad, for this wonderful um, report and all the encouraging um, items that we have heard. Thank you very much. Um, please, any of the advisory bodies would like to take the floor, mute, as Mr. Mute. Muhammad Chair. mentioned? Mr. Chair, we cannot hear you, please. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me now? You are still muted, Chair. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you okay. now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad, again, for this uh, great report and all the remarks and in a very positive uh, outcomes of the report from Africa. Thank you very much. Um, as Mr. Muhammad mentioned, um, is there um, any advisory bodies who would like to take the floor at this moment? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Please Ikom go ahead. Take a floor. Yeah. On behalf of the advisory bodies, ECOM, ECOMOS, and IUCN, we would like to extend our thanks to the World Heritage Center and the African World Heritage Fund for this for the excellent work on the implementation of the third periodic reporting cycle for the African region. The advisory bodies were pleased to take part in this very useful exercise, despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, which required the latter parts of the exercise to be conducted virtually. All parties managed to achieve a remarkable successful result, and we are pleased to be part of this 100% completed reporting cycle for presentation at this section of the World Heritage Committee. The advisory bodies has engaged intensively with the focal points of the African state parties, as well as the site managers. And in our opinion, this engagement has proved to be extremely valuable in terms of coming to a greater understanding of the issues related to conservation and management of property inscribed on the World Heritage List. This, the advisory bodies, remain committed to engage and support the African state parties as the monitoring and management of inscribed sites proceed into the next cycle. The advisory bodies are actively involved in a number of programs that are established on the African continent. In particular, we highlight to the ongoing three years agreement between IUCN and the African World Heritage Fund with a focus on upstream nomination support, including support for state parties in the preparation of tentative list and new nomination, as well as the application of the IUCN tools and guidelines to support the conservation, management, and sustainability of natural world heritage properties in Africa. 
through the IUCN Green List of Protected and Conserved Areas, IUCN supports the improved governance of natural world heritage sites in West and Central Africa, and the capacity of site manager to assess management effectiveness. IUCN continues to provide important technical support to state parties through its IUCN regional offices and sees IUCN expert commissions from providing technical guidance on matters such as avian influenza outbreaks and potential mining projects to supporting local women and youth associations to improve economic activities leading tourism and conservation. ECROM has recently launched a new regional program, Youth Heritage Africa, with partners, African World Heritage Fund, and Ecology Patrimony Africa. The program aims to ensure a better engagement with young people towards a long-term sustainable conservation and use of heritage of the region. ECOMOS and ECOM are also working with the African World Heritage Fund and other partners on the implementation of a program focusing on the identification and conservation of the modern heritage of Africa. ECOMOS has actively partnered with the Getty, the, with the Getty Conservation Institute in the presentation of two workshops focusing on the 20th century historic thematic framework, testing the methodology and exploring how the framework could assist in the identification of modern heritage of the continent. ECOMOS has also introduced a program known as the Africa Initiative, which aims to connect professionals working on the African world heritage programs and projects and to provide a virtual platform for networking and information sharing. The program has a particular emphasis on emerging professionals. All of these programs will benefit from and take advantage of the information gained during the third cycle of reporting, of critical reporting, demonstrating the value of this important exercise. In conclusion, we wish to reiterate our support to the state parties as we continue to prioritize the continent's work to actively position itself within the world heritage arena. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to know whether there are any comments on this agenda item. Please, Uganda, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the delegation of Uganda would like to thank the World Heritage Center for the data collected and the analysis to the facilitate the evaluation of the progress of the African development in the implementation of the World Heritage Convention. I chair, based on the evidence presented in the report, there is need for any hast awareness and capacity building for state parties to understand the need for credible and regular periodic reporting. We also realize there is still great need uh, for sites to be nominated on the World Heritage List. And so, so many sites qualify uh, to be inscribed on the World Heritage List. In this regard, we realize the need also for support in capacity building for application of the World Heritage Convention and the generation of credible nominations for enhanced World Heritage representation on the World Heritage on the African continent. We further note that the protection of world heritage on the African continent, like elsewhere on the globe, is greatly being affected by climate change. In this regard, the evaluation of the world heritage protection based on impacts of climate change needs to be revisited. In implementation of appropriate strategies for communities are living next to world heritage properties, we need therefore to raise a lot of awareness uh, so that communities can appro uh, appropriately understand and appreciate uh, the, the need uh, to live uh, with these World Heritage properties and to conserve them. It should further be noted that uh, for some African states to comply with the provisions of the World Heritage Convention, technical support 
from the World Heritage Center will be of paramount importance. All the above will translate into a need for more resources. It is therefore our hope that this aspect will be addressed adequately before this committee puts a seal on the next budgets of the World Head of the Secretariat. I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Uganda. Now, Brazil, you have the floor, please. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to all my colleagues. Good morning to all my colleagues. Mr. President, I would like, uh, first of all, to congratulate my African colleagues for the year, for this year, as the African Union Year of the Arts, Culture, and Heritage. And of course, to welcome Somalia to the UNESCO World Heritage Family. Mr. President, we thank the Secretariat for this extensive periodic report on Africa. As one of the UNESCO's two global priority strategy actions in favor of the African continent must be reflected in all areas of the organization and in none more so than the world heritage, where we see that the whole African continent still accounts for only 12% of the list sites, and but compromises 41% of the property in the list of world heritage in danger. This is a situation that we need to change. And we are glad to see from the report that different initiatives have been undertaken in this sense, in close cooperation with the African World Heritage Fund and in line with the goals set for by the African Union Agenda 2063. The Africa we want. These initiatives take many different forms and they are all very important, but the only way to produce structural transformative changes is by means of building capacities in the Africa continent that stays in Africa continent so that Africa themselves are able to redress the present situation by improving management and conservation of their sites by becoming themselves actors in multiplying capacity building activities in Africa and by presenting successful nominations to the World Heritage List. Brazil is also trying to be part in this process, working with Africa countries through UNESCO by means of the Category 2 Center Lucio Costa in Rio de Janeiro, but also directly in bilateral initiatives, such as the recent collaboration with Cameroon in the preparation of the nomination of the port of Bimbia to the World Heritage List, which will be followed by a workshop to develop local skills on the collection and registration of oral memories. In this process, we must always have in mind, Mr. President and dear colleagues, the need to strike a balance between heritage conservation and development needs, as underlined by the 2016 Nog Nogorongoro Declaration. As we have been saying in this committee, Development without conservation is compromised, but there can be no adequate protection without development. Finally, Mr. Chair, I would like to express Brazil's strong support for the goals of the Regional Action Plan 2127. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Brazil, for your comments. Now, China, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. China commends the successful completion of the third periodical re reporting exercise in the Africa region against the challenges posed by the global COVID-19 pandemic. We also commend the joint efforts of the state parties in Africa, site managers, World Heritage Center, UNESCO regional offices and the advisory bodies, as well as the African World Heritage Fund. <clears throat> China has reviewed the report prepared by the center, listened to other committee members carefully. We share 
the concern that Africa is still underrepresented in the World Heritage List and overrepresented in the Danger List. The report has pointed out that the inscriptions have generally positive impacts on African properties in various areas, with enhanced recognition, improved conservation, development of international collaboration, to name just a few. We expect to see more African properties inscribed on the list in the coming years, and hope that the third periodical review reports exercise will bring good experiences in preparing nominations, dossiers, as well as conserving African properties. China endorses the structure of the proposed regional action plan 2021 to 2027 for the African region, which has a high relevance to the issues raised during the third periodical review. We further take note with appreciation that the action plan is aligned to the African Union Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. We are also happy to see the good practices shared by the African site managers. China hosted the site managers forum just before this committee session. And uh, we look forward to more exchanges with African site managers in this regard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, China. Now, Ethiopia, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. We also thank the Center for this uh, report. Uh, Chair, uh, I think uh, we have to be quite uh, honest in our assessment in that the baseline from which we're starting uh, is a baseline of failure. Uh, as was highlighted by my colleague from Brazil, when a continent as big as Africa with the history and uh, the wealth of Africa is only represented by 12% of the site. And on, that, on top of that, we have 41% of the endangered list. That cannot be a sign that things are going in the right direction. So it's a collective failure. Now, the question that is before us, are we serious collectively in addressing this collective failure? That is the most important. If we are serious about it, we can address it collectively. If not, then we can go on doing what we've been doing and we will have still the same results. Expecting different results while doing the same thing, I think is the definition of uh, folly or madness. Uh, so in order for us to have different results, we have to do things differently. Now, I think the whole uh, start of it should be, in our humble opinion, a baseline analysis of where we are in the African country. Uh, to, uh, a baseline analysis or study conducted by African countries together with uh, the center, with the African World Heritage Fund and others who are willing to support us to see where we are in terms of our expertise, uh, whether it is in terms of inscription, whether it is in terms of management of sites, conservation of sites, uh, and also where we are financial. That will give us a clearer picture of what we need to do and uh, what kind of uh, support we will need to mobilize, whether it's technical support or uh, financial, sustainable financial support. So uh, while thanking the center for this report, Mr. Mohammed, we take away that uh, uh, from the report that uh, the improvements uh, that have been evoked uh, cannot make us uh, satisfied, far from it, given the realities, the concrete realities. That in order to change it, we will need the will, the strong will of member states or state parties, the strong commitment of the center, uh, and the support of our friends in the global community. Uh, the China has generously offered many support and welcome it and thank China and others in Europe, in America, in Asia to help us uh, achieve our noble objective of making the World Heritage List a truly World Heritage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ethiopia. Your comments are well noted. South Africa, please, you have the floor.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for giving us the floor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think the third cycle period, period uh, reporting exercise in Africa region was partly undertaken under complex, difficult, and unpredictable uh, circumstances. As a result of COVID-19 pandemic and the related restrictions as such, South Africa would like to thank every individual who has contributed to the achievement attained to date in this reporting cycle. But Chairperson, I think we will align our concerns uh, what uh, the extinguished um, um, uh, ambassador has raised in terms of the, the compounding issues um, experienced by you know, the Africa region especially. And these issues have been compounded by the diversion of funding uh, to deal with the emergencies around uh, COVID-19. And we have seen in most countries that uh, treasury allocation or the national fiscals is no longer favoring the, 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 the sites that we have listed in terms of the uh, heritage uh, convention. And the biggest questions that uh, site managers gets asked is how can we reach sites in the continent? We have made these facilities sustainable in such a way that they start to be financially sustainable and generate revenue for themselves. And I think the big question will be how do we move forward in terms of resource mobilization uh, for such properties to ensure that they continue to stay in the World Heritage List. They don't digress and ultimately end up in the list in danger or totally removed from the World Heritage List. And I think these are the questions that we need to constantly ask and see how do we balance the old debate on development vis-a-vis -vis conservation. And I think for me, from where I'm sitting and the country is sitting, the two can coexist and co-depend on each other on these matters. I thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, South Africa. Now, Egypt, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I will be very brief. This is just to support all what has been said by uh, Ethiopia uh, a, few, a few minutes ago. Uh, Chair, what the situation uh, right now in Africa, Africa uh, is, uh, is, despite all what we can uh, say, uh, very, uh, let's, let's put it this way, very sad in terms of uh, capacity building uh, related to the 1972 Convention. Uh, the African continent lacks expertise, and uh, not only uh, not only in denomination, as uh, has there been there is a lot of uh, focus on it, but also on the conservation, on the management plan, on making making the required studies, the heritage impact assessment studies, etc. Uh, we the, the, if if we are really serious about uh, the African continent, then we should really focus on how to increase the expertise, how to make the African countries rely on themselves and uh, also enhance the intercooperation between the different African states. Uh, but this we will never be able to do it alone. Uh, we need the advisory bodies also to do the part of their efforts. Uh, we, we, we checked the document, I think it was a few months ago, distributed within another meeting uh, following within uh, 1972 convention about the, uh, the expertise uh, or the geographical repartition uh, of expertise within the different advisory bodies. And I think there is uh, that there should be made the link uh, between the lack of expertise from the African countries and this the status uh, of uh, the of the African countries right now. And it's about time I think that we take this matter seriously. 
um, not only by uh, by lip service and by by making or arranging one or two uh, seminars uh, right and left, but maybe by starting to create uh, a real database uh, of it, starting to push the advisory bodies to rely more on Africans uh, and to give us uh, also the the, uh, the 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 advancement that I'm making in it. Uh, and advancements must be measured uh, precisely and not only uh, verbally. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Egypt, very much. Uh, now I would like to ask Mr. Muhammad to um, reply and answer some of the comments made earlier. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. I mean, there was no question per se, but there was comment from a distinguished committee member. Most of them, they were just to thanks what we have done so far. But there were two comments from a delegation of uh, distinguished member from uh, Ethiopia and Egypt, which I wanted to comment a little bit. Of course, we fully agree with, uh, with, uh, with observations of uh, the distinguished delegate from Ethiopia, but if we wanted to change, if we wanted to do better, we have to change radically. And I just wanted to, 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 to ensure, I mean, uh, distinguished delegate ambassador that this has already been started. One of observation, and this I'm, I'm giving just information that uh, we, we can discuss this further. One of the issues that we have kind of observed during periodic reporting exercise, and the good thing is that periodic reporting exercise is also tools which give us ability to analysis. Those, we can do deep analysis, but this is also give us kind of analysis for those uh, six years of implementation. One of the things that we have we have seen when it comes to capacity is not that African doesn't have expert, but most of these experts were located in state part in the countries, in administration, and the mobility is extremely very, very high. So you train expert for the within 20 years, 30 years, he become expert, he retired, and you don't have him anymore. This is this is the observation we have seen. So what we have decided now to do is that we create this mentorship program. We enhance this ex, uh, knowledge, but we want now to bring more to institution, to universities. Is where this capacity can grow. If we continue to just give capacity to site managers and directors, they will learn within 30 years, 20 years, and they're they retired. When we retire, we start from zero. So this is to show, Ambassador, just an observation that we have seen it, and we have already changes. Now what we are doing, we are focusing on mentorship, to make sure that we train more experts, as a distinguished delegate of uh, Egypt said, we train more experts, but we want to train them in university, we want to train them in institutions, we have EPA, we have CHEDAS, and other learning institutions. So we are doing maps now to understand which other institution and university in Africa which can have these hubs, and of course, as Ines Ikrom said, we'll develop these hubs so that this knowledge will grow. Rather than the system we are treating now, the knowledge grow at a time it goes down because of mobility, because of the age, because of uh, I mean, demography. So just to say that we agree with you, uh, Excellency, that thing has to change, but we just wanted to assure that thing, thing has already started to change, and we are changing now. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Mohammed. Uh, Ethiopia, you had your hand raised. Would you like to take the floor? May I? Could you hear me, Mr. Chairman? I can, we can hear you rarely, badly. Okay, I'm sorry. It's, uh, I think, a network problem, but uh, I wanted to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me right now? I, I wanted to add a little on what uh, is already uh, said by uh, our ambassador, Ethiopian ambassador, and the Brazilian uh, Excellency. I wanted to add a little bit on how we should uh, go on changing the focus on uh, looking at the who is actually the actual player in Africa. Uh, if we consider, for example, climate change or balancing change between development and conservation, there is a minimum uh, percentage of uh, experts in the ground who are actually engaged in this process. So as I was also part of this, 
uh, monitoring the, the report cycle uh, with uh, Mr. Mohammed and others, I would like to focus on concentrating on who are the actual uh, actors, including the community, the local managers, higher learning institutions, and also intellectuals at destination or close by areas. So from practice, what we found very important is to bring a platform where sector offices, higher learning institutions, and communities can work in collaboration, but not starting at a time and stopping but continuously working on it, doing a monitoring and evaluation process so that changes can happen in the ground like what has happened everywhere. It's just like we're talking about the history that has happened somewhere in developed countries. We need to do in a contextually right way that we engage all the required stakeholders, as I said, including the private sector, higher learning institutions, communities, experts, and higher learning institutions, and develop a working platform, a, a working uh, modality, so that we get engaged all the relevant stakeholders, starting from knowing what is around them, uh, up to understanding the concept of conservation development and making or striking a balance in between. This is what I want to add. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ethiopia. Your comments are well noted. Thank you. Oman, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will not take long. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, Mohammed Juma, the Chief of Section for Africa. I know how, I mean, in, 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 he is very, very active to fundraise for, for the continent and how also approachable he is whenever we call him for any information. So thank you, Mohammed, for that. The second um, point is regarding the point of human and, and financial mobilization, financial resource mob mobilization. And this is very important, I think, to, to develop the human resources, we need also the financial resources. And therefore, this is a call for all of us to help this continent um, uh, to develop its capacity. And here again, I'm calling, uh, um, a general a general opinion about all the region, not only for the African and, and the Arab state. I think I'm calling the World Heritage Center to change their approach in capacity building. And, and again, I'm trying to emphasize on this model uh, kits, whatever we call it, and to build the capacity of member states. Let's use the proverb that don't give me a fish, but I mean, train me to fish, please. So this is very important, I think, for the member states to have their capacity to do their files to manage, to absorb, to follow, et cetera. And therefore, I think changing the approach in capacity building is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Oman. Again, well noted. Thank you very much. Mr. Mohammed, would you like to take the floor? Thank you very much, Amin. No, just agree with what has been said and definitely will follow those uh, advice. Thank you. Thank you. So I see no more um, comments or questions. Thank you then. Now let's turn to draft decision 44 come 10 B. But before doing so, I would like to ask Ms. Rapporteur if she has received any proposals for amendment regarding this draft decision. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have received an amendment from the distinguished delegation of Uganda it concerns paragraph four of the draft decision as shown on the screen, um, which reads, commends the authorities of South Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, and Kenya for hosting sub-regional workshops for the third cycle of periodic reporting exercise. The rest of the paragraphs of the draft decision remains as it was originally distributed, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Reporter. So it's basically just commending South Africa. Thank you, Ganda, for that comment. So, um, as I see no more amendments and proposals, uh, we should go and declare draft decision 44, com 10B adopted. Thank you very much. Again, now I declare item 10B closed.
Sorry, Mr. Chair. I think this, uh, the African World Heritage Fund wishes to speak. Yes, Please. exactly. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rosler. Please um, go ahead. Africa World Fund. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Le Fonds pour le patrimoine mondial africain salue le processus et les résultats obtenus pour ce troisième cycle de rapports périodiques pour la région Afrique. Le rapport illustre au moins trois aspects qui ont été évoqués par les distingués membres du comité. D'abord, c'est la preuve d'une excellente coopération entre le Centre du patrimoine mondial, les organisations consultatives et le Fonds pour le patrimoine mondial africain euh, grâce à la mise en œuvre d'une équipe de coordination qui, disons, a été écoutée et a permis de réaliser les objectifs euh, décrits. Ce rapport euh, illustre aussi notre capacité d'adaptation puisque, comme cela a été dit pendant la présentation du rapport, euh, l'exercice a commencé juste au début de la pandémie du COVID-19, ce qui donc a, nous a obligés à faire preuve de beaucoup d'inventivité pour arriver au 100 de remplissage des de, de questionnaires. Ce rapport illustre aussi un certain nombre de challenges qui restent extrêmement prioritaires et préoccupants pour notre région, entre autres, le renforcement des capacités professionnelles et institutionnelles, mais aussi la question du financement durable. Et en tant qu'organisation qu chargée de coordonner un peu la stratégie du patrimoine mondial sur le continent africain, le, je voudrais profiter de cette occasion en tant que directeur du fonds pour lancer un appel à tous les membres du comité afin que des mécanismes de financement durable puissent être alloués au fonds pour faire son travail. Enfin, Monsieur le Président, je voudrais réaffirmer ici l'engagement du Fonds pour le patrimoine mondial africain à rester euh, disponible à travailler avec le Centre du patrimoine mondial et les organisations consultatives pour la mise en œuvre des résultats. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Now, dear colleagues, dear delegates, I would like to suggest that we take a 15-minute break for now. And um, before doing so, I would like to recall that for tomorrow, as indicated earlier in the Bureau meeting, it will take place tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Paris time tomorrow. So remember, one um, a half hour earlier uh, due to the heavy agenda we have tomorrow. So the plenary meeting will start tomorrow at 11 Paris time sharp instead of 10.30. Thank you very much. See you in 15 minutes.
Dear colleagues, dear delegates, let's start our meeting. Just want to recall tomorrow, 10.30, the bureau meeting in the morning and 11 o'clock, the plenary session of tomorrow due to the heavy agenda. Thank you very much. Now, let's go, dear colleagues, and now proceed to our agenda item 10C on the progress of follow-up activities and implementation of the action plans for the second cycle of periodic reporting for all regions. The relevant document for this item is document, document 10C. As you remember, by decision 15ext.com3, the committee decided that this agenda item would be adopted without debate. Therefore, I invite you, dear colleagues, to proceed with the adoption of the draft decision 44.10C, but before doing so, I would like to ask Ms. Reporter if she has received any proposals for amendment regarding this draft decision. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We haven't received any amendments on this draft decision. Thank you. Are there any comments from the room? I see none. I there, therefore declare the draft decision 44.10C adopted. Thank you very much. And now I declare item 10C of our agenda closed. Let's continue to our item 10D, which is about the progress report on the preparation of the third cycle of periodic reporting, which is contained in document 10D. Also, as you recall, by decision 15ext.com3, the committee decided that this agenda item would be adopted without debate. I therefore invite you, dear colleagues, to proceed with the adoption of the draft decision 44.10D. But before doing so, I would like to ask again Ms. Reporter if she has received any proposal for amendments regarding this draft decision. We have received no amendments, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Are there any comments? I see none. I therefore declare the draft decision 44.10D adopted. In continue, continuing our timetable, dear colleagues, you will recall that it was decided to examine the draft decision 44.7.1 and 44.7.2 on the state of conservation of World Heritage properties at the end of our debate on items 7A and 7B. This agenda item was introduced on Friday 17 July by the director of the World Heritage Center and the advisory bodies. Before we move to the examination of the two draft decisions, I would like to know whether there are any comments on this matter. I see none. Then let's proceed then. I now invite you to adopt the draft decision 44.7.1. But before doing so, I would like to ask Ms. Reporter if she has received any amendments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have received an amendment from the distinguished delegation of Kyrgyzstan to the decision 44.71 as shown on the screen. The proposed modification concerns paragraph four of the decision, um, which reads, welcomes the matrix structure developed by the World Heritage Center in consultation with the advisory bodies, which provides a clear framework to report back to the committee on the implementation of the prior two recommendations and requests them to prepare an implementation plan. We have uh, relocated the phrase that was added by Kyrgyzstan. I hope it is acceptable. These are all the amendments, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Rapporteur. As it is just the adding of this phrase, 
I see Kyrgyzstan would like to take the floor. Please, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> yes, we added this um, small change to this uh, item. And uh, yeah, it's fine if it's better fit here, but we saw that um, that matrix, we thank um, the secretariat and the advisory bodies for preparation of the matrix structure, but um, it would give more clear framework to report back if there will be a, an, an implementation plan. So this is fine. If it is clear for the secretariat and the advisory bodies, uh, how to report back on the basis of these metrics, then it can fit here. I mean, the request for preparation of an implementation plan. But to our view, um, implementation plan will help to have more clear framework to report back. As in the matrix structure, um, we don't see action actually planned to um, how this will be implemented. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Kyrgyzstan. Um, Dr. Rosler from uh, the director from the World Heritage Center, would you like to? comment on this please thank you very much mr chair we don't see a problem with this because we have already developed a matrix and uh, this um, uh, structured implementation plan we can provide information on the concrete action so that's not a problem for us thank you very much thank you so i would i suggest that um your proposal kyrgyzstan it's clear enough to the World Heritage Committee to prepare, the World Heritage Center to prepare an implementation plan and communicate it. Thank you very much. Therefore, if there's no more comments on this, I invite you to adopt the draft decision. Then I declare, therefore I declare draft decision 44COM 7.2 adopted. Thank you very much. Now we have Observer Rivers Without Borders. Please, you have the floor. Thank you for allowing us to speak after the state of conservation decision is adopted. Uh, we believe that no-go policy should focus uh, among other things on rivers, as they occupy just 1% of the terrestrial earth, but remaining 99% heavily depends on the, their ecosystem services. Due to increasing demands for scarce river resources, freshwater biodiversity is much more endangered than marine or terrestrial. Most large rivers are already dammed. Our heritage dam report demonstrates that only a handful of World Heritage properties offer reliable protection for rivers, while hundreds of others are not safeguarding rivers running through them. Despite decisions to prevent dam damage made by the committee, today, 29% of natural sites are threatened by dams. 80 properties are threatened or already degraded by hydroengineering, with vivid examples of Rufiji, Pashur, and Mekong rivers presented during this session. Our report contains recommendations how to improve protection of freshwater ecosystems to ensure that the convention does not fail on rivers. We beg you to consider this subject as extreme priority before it is too late. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your comments have been noted. Thank you. I now invite you 
to adopt the draft decision 44.7.2 as we just adopted 44.7.1. But before doing so, I would like to ask the rapporteur if she has received any amendments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We haven't received any amendments on this draft decision. Thank you. Are there any comments on this draft decision 44.7.2? I see none. Therefore, I declare draft decision 44.7.2 adopted. Thank you all very much. This therefore closes our main agenda item number seven. As we suggested from the beginning, to move item 13, that is, it was um, intended to um, be discussed tomorrow, to move it to, to today. So now let's analyze and, 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 and debate about item number 13, devoted to the international assistance to this end, and then I would like to invite to pay attention to document 44 com 13. Ms. Joydi Yohaswar, Deputy Director of the World Health Center, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Um, with regard to document 13, um, the document WHC slash 21 slash 44 com slash 13. The first part of the document is related to international assistance requests within the purview of the World Heritage Committee, that is requests above 30,000 US dollars. Please note that all requests under this amount are within the purview of the chairperson of the World Heritage Committee. The list of the requests approved in 2018, 2019, and in 2020, 21, until 31st May 2021 can be found in the annex of the document 44.com slash 13. Um, as you see on this uh, table, the, uh, the screen uh, shows a summary of the request submitted to the committee for its decision. The first request comes from Madagascar for activities to address the key threats for which the rainforests of the Atsinanana were inscribed on the list of World Heritage in Danger in 2010, with the aim to lead to the removal from the danger list. Due to the extent of the revisions to be made to the request, which would result in an entirely different project, and to the fact that the results of the request previously approved by the committee for this property have not been evaluated or taken into account in the preparation of this request, it is recommended not to approve it. In the meantime, another international assistance request for the rainforest of the Atsinanana for an amount of 77,356 US dollars was submitted in 2020 for the 2021 funding cycle. After a recommendation for revision by the panel of 29 January 2021, the state party decided to thoroughly rework its application in order to resubmit it by 31st October 2021 as part of the 2022 funding cycle. It is therefore hoped that a sound proposal will be submitted to the committee at its next session. The second request comes from Lao PDR 
for the completion of the heritage impact assessments and related risk analysis. In response to concerns raised about a major dam proposal and other large infrastructure projects. The request further intends to provide wider capacity building to the state body on World Heritage Impact Assessments for both natural and cultural heritage. It is therefore recommended for approval. Please note that this request was submitted for 74,500 US dollars and that in the view of the timing required for launching the studies, the chairperson approved already an amount of 30,000 US dollars. Therefore, the amount recommended for approval by the committee is only the remaining amount of 44,500 US dollars. The third request comes from Sri Lanka for structural repairs to visitor infrastructure and stabilization of rocks at Sigiriya, ancient city. There is no doubt that this proposed project is needed for visitor safety at the most popular World Heritage Site in Sri Lanka, and that the closing of the site due to the COVID-19 pandemic provides a good opportunity to implement this work. It is therefore recommended for approval. The fourth and the last request comes from North Macedonia for capacity building activities in relation to Ohrid region. This project will increase the national capacities in heritage documentation, strengthen the recognition and protection of heritage places, and could result in a sound basis for monitoring the state of conservation of the World Heritage property and the valorization of its cultural assets. It is therefore recommended for approval. Part two of the document provides a brief overview of the international assistance request approved in 2018-19. The main figures are shown here on the screen. As you can see, sorry, as you can see, there were 41 requests approved um, and uh, 1,391,312 US dollars granted for 30, fish, 30 beneficiary countries and 30 World Heritage properties. And finally, part three gives an update of the status of the 2021 2020-2021 budget for international assistance as of 31st May 2021. As you can see on the screen, all the funds have been used or have been earmarked for approvals under all categories of assistance except emergency assistance. As you can see below, uh, the, 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 the legend shows uh, the the international assistant budgets for cultural, uh, uh, for cultural heritage and natural heritage, for conservation and management assistance, as well as preparatory assistance. And then the last um, um, bar is for emergency assistance. However, the recent approval of a request for Sudan leaves currently only a bit more than 50,000 US dollars available for other emergency assistance requests. As there is one for Fiji in the pipeline, and since we cannot anticipate the submission uh, by the end of the year uh, of other submissions, it is therefore proposed to authorize the center to increase the emergency assistance budget if the need arises and within the limit of an additional 124,000 US dollars maximum. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairperson, I thank you and uh, invite uh, the consideration of the draft decision that is on page 26 of the English version and page 27 of the French version of the document, WHC 21 
44.13. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you very much, Mrs. Ms. Joyti Hosagrahar. Thank you very much for this presentation. Now, I would like to know whether there are any comments on these agenda items. If none, then let's proceed. I now invite you to adopt the draft decision 44.com 13, but before doing so, I would like to ask the Rapporteur if she has received any amendments of, on this draft decision proposed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We haven't received any amendments on this draft de decision, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Therefore, I declare draft decision 44 com 13 adopted. Thank you very much. Item 13 is now closed. Now let's continue with the item 44 com 8b.24 that was requested to be included in today's plenary. On this issue, I would like to ask the chair of the drafting group, Saudi Arabia, uh, to send the draft decision to the reporter so we can have this document as a base for the discussion. Please, Saudi Arabia, can you do so? In order to wait for Saudi Arabia to send the draft proposal, I suggest that we take a pause of 10 minutes. Thank you very much.
Dear colleagues, dear delegates, let's go back to our plenary. We have received a draft amendment proposal and it's been um, translated. So we'll just wait until it's on the screen. Please. Mm -hmm. So we're going, before we go through the amendment, I would like to ask if there's any comment regarding this, but before the comments of the floor, I would like to ask um, the representative of uh, Saudi Arabia to give us an introductory um, remark on this issue so we can start our conversation from here. Thank you very much. Saudi Arabia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Yes, yes, Perfect. yes. I can hear you well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to uh, clarify that this statement is uh, being given on behalf of the two co-chairs, Saudi Arabia and Norway. Uh, Mr. Chair, on 26th of July, during the examination of the plenary session of item 8B.24, uh, given a, a deadlock situation of the debate, the chairperson of the committee suggested to establish a drafting group uh, composed by Saudi Arabia, Spain, Norway, and China. The Secretariat, the advisory bodies, and the four concerned states, parties, Austria, Germany, Hungary, Slovakia, were invited to join the group as observers. Norway suggested to add Australia to the drafting group, and the chair of the committee suggested that Saudi Arabia and Norway co-chair the drafting group and asked the co-chairs of the drafting group to establish the final composition of the group, recalling the importance of having a balanced representation. In the plenary, there was no opposition to any of the above mentioned points. In order to make the best possible use of the available time, the chairmanship of this drafting group decided to establish a clear modus operandi. It was therefore decided to have 10 members from the state parties who attended the meeting, including co-chairs from the committee ensuring geographical balance. In addition, the four states parties concerned, the Secretariat and ECOMOS were also invited. The first meeting took place yesterday between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. Paris time. After having listened to the Secretariat, to ICOMOS, and the four concerned states parties, these participants were requested to leave and the debate continued to be held between the 10 members of the committee forming the drafting group. As this meeting could not come to a conclusion, it was felt that there was a need for an extra meeting, and we have announced that a new invitation would be sent either for the afternoon of the same day or for the morning of the following day. Later in the same day, a new invitation was sent for a meeting to be held at 4.30 p.m. However, as the plenary was still going on, we decided to postpone the beginning of the meeting at 4.55 p.m. to allow for more participation. The second meeting of the drafting group took place yesterday between 4.55 p.m. and 5.55 p.m. Paris time. Seven out of 10 committee members forming the drafting group were present. At the end, there was clear divergence of views. There was an emerging need, however, for the drafting group to put forward an option for the committee's consideration for a proposal of referral. In this regard, we provided an amendment to the, the repertoire. In conclusion, it's important to note, Mr. Chair, that due to the delicacy of the mandate given to this drafting group and the time constraint, we tried our best to reach an agreement, but unfortunately, to no avail. And we trust that the committee, through its wise membership, 
will reach a consensual decision today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Saudi Arabia, for um, the report on the drafting group. Now I would like to open the floor uh, for uh, comments and inputs on, 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 on this issue. Please raise your hands if you want to take the floor. Now we go to Ethiopia, please. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, we thank uh, the Saudi delegation for their efforts. Um, but having said this, Mr. Chair, um, we, we, we are a bit uh, saddened by the way uh, the working group uh, went about uh, its work. Uh, in the first meeting, we participated. And uh, along with 10 countries, 10 countries, members of this committee, we submitted amendments for inscription. Uh, that draft was supposed to be the basis of discussion of a second meeting. Unfortunately, for the second meeting of yesterday, we could not participate and we did not participate because we didn't receive anything to that effect. In fact, from our understanding, uh, only Spain, Bahrain, China, Norway, and Australia participated in yesterday's meeting. So in no way, when yesterday's meeting and the consensus, quote unquote, reached at that meeting constitute a consensus of the working group. It cannot be because we were not there. For whatever reason, which we don't want to dwell into, but we were not there. Having said that, Mr. Chair, we remain adamant in putting forward our amendments together with other nine countries and in total, Submitting for the consideration of this committee the adoption of a decision for inscription of this heritage site. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Ethiopia. Now, Spain, you have the floor, please. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Nuestra intención es clarificar. Un poco la situación desde nuestro punto de vista con el respeto a cuál pueda ser la posición de cada cual. Como todos ustedes saben, España, junto con otros países, presentó una enmienda en el sentido de la inscripción porque entendíamos en ese momento perdón, que como la propuesta venía de inscripción, no estamos hablando de una propuesta internacional solo, estamos hablando una, de una propuesta que viene de muchos años, creo que 18 si no me equivoco, que le quedan algunos años bastantes más y que no es una propuesta internacional, es una propuesta intercontinental que cuando estén concluidos todos sus segmentos, sus segmentos eh, eh, unirá tres continentes. Bueno, entendíamos que es una propuesta, por tanto, excepcional y que ante la circunstancia que se derivaba, que habían salidas excepcionales que por ser tan excepcional no sentaría precedente. O si lo sienta, sería para propuestas similares que también unan tres continentes, pero no para una internacional que una, dos, tres o cuatro países. Esa fue nuestra mejor voluntad. Todos saben que no hubo ningún acuerdo, que se creó el grupo de trabajo. A nosotros nos sorprendió que en el primer grupo de trabajo, eh, o ayer por la mañana, fueran 10 eh, países y que por la tarde estábamos menos. Los que debatimos efectivamente éramos Bahrein, España, eh, y Australia y Uganda, también estaba Tanzania, China estuvo algún rato, pero eh, llamó la atención, como bien ha señalado el distinguido delegado de Etiopía, de Etiopía y algunos otros de por la mañana habían estado, pues, eh, eh, no, que habían estado, no participaran por la tarde. Pensamos, intuimos que es que habían dejado de tener interés en el tema. La falta de acuerdo entre los cuatro países que manteníamos posiciones más o menos claras eh, nos, nos llevó a decir, en este caso a España, bueno, no podemos ir al comité sin alguna salida. Veamos de los dos documentos que hay, inscripción el otro, cuál de los dos pues, puede concitar una solución de tránsito. Bien, ese, esto es lo que se plantea aquí. España dijo siempre que podría, si había un documento que hiciera feliz a todas las partes, estamos dispuestos a ser flexibles. Pero nuestra sorpresa viene cuando después de terminar la reunión nos, nos empiezan a llamar algunos eh, colegas diciendo que no han sido convocados. Yo he planteado, he planteado en el buró esta mañana que se, se reabriera el tema porque esto había sucedido. En el buró se nos ha dicho que habían sido convocados todos. Hay una contradicción de información. El buró, en el buró se mantiene que todos fueron invitados. A mí personalmente, al menos tres miembros me dicen que no fueron. Y por eso consideramos que ante esa confusión era importante dejar que de nuevo, aunque no tenga más trabajo, 
que el comité aceptara el, abriera el debate. En ese debate España tiene su posición, como ya sabían, y seguimos dispuestos a que se haga un acuerdo, pero nuestra posición era la que manifestamos al principio con el resto de países. Y nos gustaría escuchar ahora a los, a la, a la, al resto de miembros del comité, incluso si se tercia, si hay lugar a los estados proponentes para que expliquen en qué situación ven la, el, la propuesta. Nada más y muchas gracias. Gracias, España. Now, South Africa, you have the floor, please. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairperson. We have listened carefully to the uh, uh, overview as given by Saudi Arabia on the process, but also response by state parties who participated in the informal process. We are disappointed that this in the informal process has not yielded the desired uh, outcome. We see that an injustice is about to be committed. And that injustice is for almost 20 years, state parties spend resources and time working on this file. And some of the state parties face a situation where if a decision is not taken, they may by law be forced to disengage from this process. This is not the fault of the state parties or the state parties it is because of our own process. A very, an excellent file has been given to us to consider. During the, the debate, we were informed and ECOMOS did not deny the fact that for a very long time, they have been seized with this file. The only step standing between the inscription of this file is a technicality that one state party withdrew part of, of the, the, the elements or components of, of this dossier. But that does not detract from the fact that for almost 14 to 20 years, e-commerce was seized with the file. They have knowledge of the file and they can make an opinion if they want to make that opinion about what they observed. Given this situation, we are left with no option but to stand on the side of the state party and support an amendment that seeks to inscript this property. I submit you. Thank you very much, South Africa. Brazil, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, here, here up here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let's not, uh, as we say in Brazil, let's not cry of the spilled milk. Uh, if we were or we were not invited, if we were or we were not present in, the, in one of the meetings of this uh, working group, uh, we have already some uh, important elements that we need to share among all of the members of the committee that were not <coughs> present in the different uh, discussions. Uh, the first of, of them is uh, we have, Mr. President, during this process, reflect and we have consulted with, with among us, some delegations. We have sought experts' advice on this matter. Unfortunately, we have not get to a consensual solution in this case, but there are a few points that have been clearer for us in these two days. And I want to, to bring those uh, points to us in order to enrich our discussions and mainly, and most important, to help us to take a decision uh, during this uh, debate. The first one is that, and this is important, all of them are important, but the first one is there is no obstacle to inscribing different parts of the frontier of the Roman Empire at different times. And there is no general unifying principle for each specific part, setting it apart from the others. There are all parts of the limits, and we just inscribed yesterday one separate part of them in the lower Germany that could be complemented today by one part of the Danube, Danube uh, limits, and tomorrow by other parts reaching up Africa in the future. Second, the outstanding universal value does not pertain to each individual part itself, but to its significance as a part of a much larger whole, the frontiers of the Roman Empire. 
and each part continues to be a part of the whole, even if reduced, so long as their attributes continue to exist, and they do in the fortress, watch, uh, watch over bridges, and so on. The OUV was recognized for each part of the limits already inscribed on the World Heritage List, and also for the components of this specific part twice. Third, and this is important, it is questionable that that inscription, the description of these sites should constitute a very dangerous precedent for the future. As our colleague from Spain have said, this is an extremely, an entirely exceptional basis in which we are taking care, taking this decision, clearly expressing that it does not constitute a precedent for the future decision. In that line, Mr. President, Brazil, after due consideration of the different aspects of the case presented here and in the drafting group, we support the amendment presented by Spain with the addition of the new paragraph six. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Brazil. Um, the order of interventions is Thailand, Uganda, Bosnia, Norway, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Oman, Nigeria, and Mali, and then Egypt. And after that, I would like to give the floor as it was requested from Spain, uh, from the three countries involved to also make their statements. Thank you very much. So now, Thailand, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we thank the working group for, for its effort. Unfortunately, the working group could not arrive at a consensus. Thailand was part of the, the working group, Mr. Chairman. Thailand, on our part, believes the nominating states have prepared an excellent nomination, working with a number of stakeholders involving much efforts and resources for many, many years. The property has been evaluated three times and two times recommended for inscription. Thailand believes that the OUV identified by the advisory body Nicomas still stands. We need to acknowledge the role of many stakeholders in the preparation of the nomination, as well as acknowledge the work done. Thailand is of the view that the nomination should not be subject to any referral. Therefore, we support the inscription of the frontiers of the Roman Empire, the Danube lines at this meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Thailand. Now, Uganda, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uganda did not attend the, the meeting uh, that, that is mentioned because we did not see the invitation if it came at all. My delegation is of the view that the 77 component parts remaining after the withdrawal of the Hungarian components from the nomination still represent the essence of the frontiers of the Roman Empire. We have observed that the attributes in the original nomination are still present. These are significant aspects of that part of the frontier. Requests by Ecomost or some of the sites have been accepted and executed by the state's parties. My delegation therefore believes that the remaining 77 component parts are of outstanding universal value. The highest level of integrity of the double limbs of the Danube limbs will be reached only after the component parts of the entire frontier have been included. Since it is not possible to nominate the whole of the Danube limbs in one go, it is only fair to inscribe the west segment of the Danube limbs. My delegation therefore supports the amendment proposed by Spain to inscribe the site. I thank you. Thank you, Uganda. Bosnia, please, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. 
Ben, je vais être très bref. Nous soutenons l'inscription de, 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 de ce bien. On, a, on en a déjà parlé pour ne pas répéter les 18 ans et, et tout ce travail qui a, qui a été fait. Et puis l'opinion opi, des experts et, et l'effort investi de tous ces pays qui y participent. Donc, une reconnaissance de cet effort par des autorités, par des spécialistes, euh, ne nous empêche pas, en rien, à mon avis, à insister sur l'inscription. Donc, euh, la Bosnie-Herzégovine est pour l'inscription de ce bien. Quand, quand il s'agit, bon, le problème qui est, qui est survenu avec euh, la décision de, 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 de Hongrie, peut rester et peut être cette, cette situation peut changer. Donc, il peut changer d'opinion plus tard, mais annuler un travail, ça ne me paraît pas raisonnable. Donc, nous sommes fermement pour l'inscription. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Bosnia. Now, Norway, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. I hope my microphone is working uh, at this moment. Can you confirm, please? Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have to admit I struggle with where to start now. We have, in good faith, participated in a drafting group in which three hours of deliberations took place. We were asked to chair, together with Saudi Arabia, and we were asked to find a compromise. We left each other yesterday evening with a referral proposal at hand. We are well aware of the significant pressures for inscription of this property earlier and now. But I have to say, Norway, elected amongst the 194 states parties of this convention to uphold its credibility and legitimacy, also of this very committee and this meeting, cannot with open eyes agree to this inscription proposal. And I, to make some clarifications on the meetings and the processes, we have requested that all the meeting invitations are sent to us screen dumps from the invitations from Outlook, from the Secretariat of the World Heritage Center and also what was sent from us in Norway. We have checked them extremely carefully after these serious allegations raised. There are no discrepancies whatsoever. We have visual proof of this. No discrepancies are found. These are very serious allegations which are false. I have to admit, we have to disassociate ourselves fully from these procedural allegations and the distrust, distrust expressed to the chairs of the drafting group. Saudi Arabia did a wonderful job as a chair of this group, and we find it incredible that we are met with these in, uh, allegations. To return to the matter at hand, for us, the critical matter is related to the infringement and violation of Article 11.2 of the Convention and Paragraph 132, 168, and Annex 6 of the Operational Guidelines. Red flags abound. The warnings from the Secretariat are massive. The consequences are known. Applying just a minimum of the precautionary principle in case makes it impossible for us to accept this. This is about the credibility of this whole system to which we are the guardians, the guardians and the rulers. In my conclusion, I wish to ask ICMOS and WHC again to explain to us these very facts. And then whatever happens on the floor will happen. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Norway. Thank you. Saudi Arabia, please, you have the floor. Mr. Chair, thank you so much. And I'll try to make the most out of the three minutes given to me. I totally feel for the frustration in the room. Um, and we've known from the very beginning that this is a very difficult and daunting mandate. Um, and we tried our utmost to uh, do it justice. Uh, and we feel for the states parties concerned uh, that uh, the file merits OUV and every single member of the drafting group agreed on that. No dispute about it. And everybody feels the, the, for the frustration of, of the states parties involved. Uh, if you allow me, uh, Mr. Chair, I want just to straighten up uh, some facts. Um, and I think uh, my Norwegian colleague uh, alluded to them uh, earlier. Uh, the invitation was sent to all 21 member states to attend a preliminary meeting, whoever is interested to come. 
10, 10 members showed up and we took attendance of that and the secretary will be given the chance to, to confirm what I'm saying right now. The first meeting at 10 a.m. was well attended. The consensus, uh, or I would say the majority was going for inscription. Therefore, as a, as a co-chair, we decided to actually use the inscription decision as a basis for discussion. And we asked the secretary to drop the referral uh, from the screen and uh, start discussing the inscription. Uh, and at the end of the meeting, it was agreed that we will start the next meeting with the inscription as a basis for discussion. And then when we attended the afternoon meeting, there were three member states absent. Russia, which withdrew. Uh, so they, noted, they notified the chair that they won't be part of the, uh, uh, the drafting group anymore. And we thanked them for that. And Guatemala and Ethiopia uh, did not show up. Uh, we also have uh, screenshots of, of the invitations being sent to the delegations' emails and the focal points specified by those, by those member states. With them not being present, we adjourned the meeting for 30 minutes to give the chance for them to show up. And we started 30 minutes late, and we ended 30 minutes late just for the sake of giving them the chance to show up. Now, just to clarify, Mr. Chair, uh, as you uh, well uh, know, because you are uh, doing it right now as a chair, your role is to read the room and uh, do uh, what it constitutes. Um, and uh, the room in the afternoon was going towards uh, what you're seeing on the screen. And impartiality is a key uh, characteristic of uh, a, a wise uh, chairmanship. So we tried our best to uh, give what the room is asking for. Uh, and uh, we hope, uh, again, uh, that under your chairmanship, uh, Mr. Chair, we can reach uh, an agreement that satisfies uh, all parties concerned. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saudi Arabia, for those comments. Thank you very much. Bahrain, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and just to, to pick up on that, um, uh, we are a committee member that has participated and all of the uh, working group meetings. And I just wanted to commend uh, the co-chairs for their uh, efficient conduct of those meetings, just for the record. Uh, my colleague from Saudi Arabia have explicitly explained the proceedings of those meetings, so I would not repeat them. Um, our position was uh, in line with the previous speakers of the committee in terms of describing this property. Uh, so uh, I will call upon your wise guidance, Mr. Chair, to. Uh, um, further narrow the gap in this committee and uh, put an end to the polarized positions we are finding ourselves in um, to put this item to an end. Thank you. Thank you, Bahrain. Oman, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Oman was the first to suggest for the referral of this um, file due to uncertainty and, and uh, the withdrawal of Hungary. Listening to the previous discussion yesterday uh, and uh, today, I, I think still the file is, is very difficult to take a position. And um, I think it's very important um, the discussion that to refer the file back for one year again and to receive it for the next committee um, in, in, in Russia. And therefore, I, I think it is wise this file to be referred. So I support the amended decision now presented by Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Thank you. Oman? Nigeria, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, actually, the, the, the nominating states have uh, prepared an excellent uh, nomination, and it has been evaluated three times two times recommended for inscription. Hundreds of stakeholders from many countries, not only in Europe, were involved in the preparation, and it is a result of many years of preparations. A lot of efforts, time, and finances. They have done everything to preserve the property for further uh, generations. That is all that a good nomination should have. That is the essence of convention. 
of the convention. So Hungary and other Danube Lime states can extend this property when they will, uh, when they are ready. The first three steps of the series of eight countries are ready now. This is a nomination with a phased approach. We see no obstacle not to inscribe. We need to inscribe now because second referral might postpone the process to infinity. And there is a risk losing the engagement of local communities and dangerous for preservation of sites. It could damage the credibility of the World Heritage Convention, not only among the professionals involved, but among the uh, general public. Nigeria is in support of the amendment draft for inscription. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Nigeria. As we continue with committee members, and then we'll hear uh, the three countries involved in the nomination. Please, Mali, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, les États proposants ont préparé une excellente proposition d'inscription et elle a été évaluée trois fois et deux fois recommandée pour inscription. Des centaines de parties prenantes de nombreux pays, pas seulement d'Europe, ont été impliquées dans la préparation et c'est le résultat de nombreuses années de préparation, de beaucoup d'efforts, de temps et de coûts financiers. Tout cela a été fait pour préserver la propriété pour les générations futures. C'est tout ce qu'une bonne nomination devrait avoir et c'est l'essence même de la Convention. Nous pensons à ce stade que d'autres États du Danib Limes peuvent étendre cette propriété lorsqu'ils lorsqu seront prêts. Les trois premières étapes de la série des huit pays sont maintenant prêtes. Il s'agit d'une proposition avec une approche progressive. Nous, nous ne voyons aucun obstacle à ne pas inscrire. Par ailleurs, il faut l'inscrire maintenant, car une deuxième saisine risque de repousser le processus à l'infini. Et là, il y a un risque de perdre l'engagement des communautés locales et un danger pour la préservation des sites. Cela pourrait nuire à la crédibilité de la Convention du patrimoine mondial. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Mali? Egypt, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I will be very brief, uh, just uh, stating three points. The first one is that uh, as co-authors uh, of the amendments that, uh, that are presented and are under consideration for this committee, we do believe that the site shall be inscribed in this committee. Uh, there are many arguments supporting this. I'm not going to repeat them. They have been eloquently being said by previous, uh, uh, previous uh, countries to, that took the floor before me. But let me just assure you again, once again, that uh, my delegation stands with the uh, rest of the delegations who would like to see the inscription now because they believe that this inscription shall be made now. On the second point, Mr. Chair, is that I think uh, I just wanted to refer to, to, to some interventions, uh, speaking about some allegations or some uh, serious allegations, uh, etc. Uh, I think we all uh, owe to uh, both the Saudi delegation and the Norwegian delegation a big uh, gratitude and a big thank. Uh, this is not an easy task. They volunteered for it. They took the responsibilities. And no one can ever uh, either uh, criticize uh, or say anything bad, uh, either directly or indirectly. Quite the contrary, Mr. Chair. I do believe that it's about time that we all say it loudly. Thank you to all of you. Thanks to both delegations for the wonderful work they, they did. And there might be a problem here and there. We might, maybe, maybe some emails have been sent, but uh, people didn't have time to check it. Maybe there was a problem in the sending, maybe because it's online session, etc. A lot of maybes, but for sure, one reality stands is that both delegations uh, are, should be thanked and thanked warmly. 
Uh, I'm saying this despite the fact that uh, I totally disagree with what my Norwegian uh, colleague said about the inscription uh, of the site, uh, but, uh, but this is uh, another issue. The third point, Mr. Chair, is that uh, we are totally in your hands. What we do believe, what should be done, is that we should consider the draft amendment that was under consideration. Uh, when when we were in the plenary last time. But again, Mr. Chair, we are totally in your hand and waiting for uh, for your wise judgment. Thank you. Thank you, Egypt. Now, Kyrgyzstan, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our delegation think that uh, at this session, we do not have enough time to go into every detail of this situation. And if, you, if we step back and think from a technical point of view, look at the consequences of um, this situation, uh, this can become a precedent for um, different situation like withdrawal of um, half of the elements after the inscription, then what happens? Uh, of course, in that case, uh, we do not accept we, uh, uh, that situation is clear for us. But here we are uh, discussing um, uh, this nomination without taking into account all the technical points. As the drafting group had much more time to discuss all these issues, uh, we think that it will be wise to take the amended decision which is proposed to us by the drafting group. And they also consider that this uh, nomination, uh, even without um, that part of uh, elements still has strong potential uh, for inscription. So um, therefore, we think that we have to take the proposed amendment by the drafting group. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Kyrgyzstan. Ethiopia, please, again. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just two things. One, the fact that we didn't come uh, was not because we didn't want to come. Uh, we may have received it, may have not have overseen it. I don't know what happened. But anyway, we went to the morning meeting, did not attend. And in the morning meeting, the consensus was for inscription and using that draft. The afternoon meeting, which we didn't attend, not because the invitation was not sent to us, but for because we maybe were too busy. I don't know. But anyway, the decision that was made was to use the referral as a basis. At any rate, that's irrelevant because in light of the importance of this issue, the 20 years that people have been working on this file, our personal feelings and our personal uh, should not matter. This is a much more important issue than, than any of us. I think we can agree on that. Having said that, Chair, an overwhelming majority of member states are asking that this site be inscribed at our session. An overwhelming majority here are asking that the initial amendments calling for inscription be used as a basis for the discussion. And we reiterate this call again, that we use the inscription draft that was uh, submitted with the amendment for inscription that was submitted and that has still the overwhelming majority of the support of the member states of this group. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ethiopia. Saudi Arabia, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like first uh, to uh, thank the members of the working group for their constructive discussion. Uh, and I have a number of issues to raise. Uh, the decision, the draft that you see in front of you is the result of the working group. It's not the amendment presented by Saudi Arabia. It's the result of the working group presented by the co-chairs who were very transparent, who were very unbiased and listened to everyone. And this is something to clarify in the beginning. Secondly, although we see a great merit for the site to be inscribed, and although we listen to the state parties and we share their views about the importance of inscribing such a site, the support for the inscription should not be built on the ground of attacking the co-chairs of this group. And Chair, Mr. Chair, dear committee members, 
I understand your sympathy. I understand your uh, desire to support such an important site, but under no grounds, I'm going to accept the integrity of Saudi Arabia, nor the transparency or the integrity of Saudi Arabia to be attacked in this esteem committee. Therefore, I would like to continue the discussion, but with this disclaimer put on record. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Saudi Arabia. Your comments and request is being recorded. Now, Norway, please, you have the floor. I'm sorry, Chair, I don't think we have requests okay, on the so, floor. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, sorry for that. Oman, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know, I got confused now um, a bit. Because the, 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 the decision submitted now by, by, by the group or the drafting group, most of the people who spoke, they are sp speaking for inscription from this group. And now the, the decision here is for referral. How is this, con I mean, contradiction? Who has imposed this decision to us here now? So we want to know, I mean, we are confused because the group who drafted this, most of them, they are for inscription and this decision is for referral. So something has to be clarified for us. Thank you. Thank you, Oman. I would like to ask Saudi Arabia and um, Norway as the co-chairs of the drafting group, the amendment proposal that we have in front of us, is that the result of your two groups discussion? Mr. Chair, you allow me? Yes, please, Saudi Arabia, you have yes, the floor. I, I, thank you. I, I think I clarified it in my previous intervention and just to, to reiterate what I said, and I think uh, uh, His Excellency, the Ethiopian ambassador said it, as co-chairs, we mirror the room. And the, the meeting in the morning was asking for an inscription. And so the basis for discussion was to inscribe the site until the last minute at 11 a.m. And everybody was there and everybody can attest to that. And then due to uh, running out of time, we asked to resume our discussions either later that day or tomorrow morning. Uh, based on the inscription uh, draft. We started the afternoon session, we started with the inscription, and we asked the room about that draft, and we started discussing it word for word until the room asked for that basis to be changed into a referral. And then we asked if that will be a good option to present to the committee and the room accepted. And then we went paragraph by paragraph until there was no objection. And here we are today presenting the result of the discussions of three hours of deliberation. I hope that clarified uh, the confusion of uh, our colleague from Oman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saudi Arabia, for that. China, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we listened uh, very, very attentive, attentively to all the colleagues who spoke uh, in front of us. Uh, first of all, my delegation would like to show our very profound gratitude to the co-chairs. They've done excellent work in this very hard, difficult situation. I fully echo what uh, the distinguished ambassador of Saudi Arabia just said. And China participated in the working group. As the host country of this session, of course, we fully, we fully anticipate the committee will have a 
consensus decision on this issue. However, we are in a very uh, difficult, delicate situation. Of course, the committee needs to have its credibility. Of course, we have to uh, uh, safeguard the credibility, credibility of the convention. So in this very difficult time, I, I just wanted to show you a very simple example. <laughs> I discussed with uh, a number of uh, uh, distinguished ambassadors yesterday. The original submission, of course, has the OUV. There is no doubt about that. It's like we have designed a four-wheel car, a four-wheel car. A good quality car is Mercedes-Benz. It's very good. There is no doubt. Now we only have three wheels. And no test, test office or test center will give us a, a qualification of a certificate to drive on the road with the three wheels. What shall we do? Maybe it's better for us to send the car back to redesign. Of course, we have three wheels cars. We have to move the, the single wheel in the front or in the rear, put in the middle. So the engine can be used. <laughs> The wheels can be used, but we have to redesign it. So I am an engineer. So we, I just want, it's not a political discussion. It is only a technical discussion. Okay. So in this case, we support uh, the text on the screen. It's why we, we know that uh, members have worked so hard, but technically we cannot do with our proper document, with our verified document. Okay, that is the technical issue. So I plead to all the dear colleagues, okay, please support the referral decision. Uh, and uh, maybe next year we fully support the inscription. So it, what I, my intervention is just want to show the, con to encourage all of us to have a consensus, okay. Uh, if my example is not correct, please, uh, uh, please uh, ignore it. Okay, <laughs> I, 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 I thank you very much uh, for your understanding. Okay, so let's uh, reach a consensus on this issue. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, China. Your example, it's well noted. South Africa, please. You have the floor. Yes, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, we, we were informed that in the in one meeting or one day in the morning the the view of the meeting was that the file should be inscribed i can imagine uh, a colleague of mine uh, of ethiopia would have gone home rest assured that in good faith um, that 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 understanding was going to to be sustained if it was in the evening it's a situation like you go to bed with an understanding that is positive. You wake up in the morning, probably you had a bad dream. And you are told that, no, what you thought you had this night, last night was changed. I think this is an injustice I'm talking about. An injustice that a state party or state parties suffered for 20 years. 20 years with resources dedicated and resources financial personnel expertise, a file that was submitted three times, twice recommended for inscription. And my distinguished ambassador from, from China correctly said that if it was a wheel, it was a car of, with four wheels and tires, and you evaluated four tires, when you remove one, it doesn't mean that your knowledge of the three goes away. Your knowledge of the three that are remaining is still intact. And so the file is known to us. All the components are known to the system. There's no way our decision to inscribe it will detract and affect negatively the credibility of the system. Not at all. For me, it would be sad if these 20 years of effort are rewarded with another extension. What message are we sending to state parties who, like us, enjoy the full protection that we all enjoy? 
I'm appealing to the committee and I'm seconding what my distinguished ambassador from, from Ethiopia proposed, that the amendment is submitted by Spain for, inscript, by Spain for inscription be the one that processed this decision. I thank you. Thank you, South Africa. Brazil, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am uh, really very delighted to listen to this discussion. Um, I thank my dear colleague from uh, China for the example that has been presented that I think is very clever and uh, very interesting. But uh, I, will, I will present it in a different way if you allow me. This is not a car with four wheel. This is a train. And the locomotive is there. And this is a four car uh, composition. We are going to take out one of the cars, but the train continue moving. No problem about that, about that. The locomotive is there. And by the way, the locomotive is there for many, many years because this is a long uh, uh, frontier of the imperial, uh, of the Roman Empire. So therefore, we have this locomotive working for a long time. Here we are going to take out one of the car of this particular composition. There is no problem, unless of course, is the restaurant and then we will may have some difficulties. But anyway, Mr. President, I think that uh, I want basically <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much uh, the delegations of Norway and South Africa, uh, South, uh, Saudi Arabia, sorry, for this extraordinary work that uh, gather many uh, delegations to discuss the possibility of finding uh, a consensus. Convergency was there yesterday morning. Con Convergency was not there, uh, eluded us in the afternoon. Things happen, this is multilateralism, it has been like that. Therefore, what we have to have in mind is that this was a group of the committee. Now, this proposal is in front of the committee is different from the group. The group decided that they reached this point, but now it's to the committee to decide how to do from, from now on, which is continue discussion in order to find a, a, a solution for this question. And by the way, the, well, I want to, to make clear and restate it, that the decision and the opinions and the positions raised here by member states are absolutely legitimate. Legitimate. We are the member states, we are the members of the committee, and the decision that we take, all the decisions that we take here, do not impair or uh, impact on the credibility of this, of this committee. This committee is credible and legitimate because we are here, we are the member states. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Brazil. Ethiopia, please, you have the floor, and um, I think this is um, the last of the committee members, and then I would request the floor from Spain is requesting the floor as well. So Ethiopia, and then Spain, and then ECOMOS, and then the three, the secretariat after ECOMOS, and then the three countries involved. Thank you very much for that. So Ethiopia, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Very interesting uh, conversation and very interesting metaphors being used, uh, especially like the one by my good friend, the ambassador of, uh, of China, the three-wheel car. For me, <laughs> this, uh, this beautiful Mercedes uh, has all the four wheels. It only lacks maybe a logo. Just because it doesn't have a logo, doesn't mean it's not a Mercedes. It's still a Mercedes. <laughs> so we should approve it. But my, my overall uh, question is uh, regarding uh, this uh, notion that is being repeated about the credibility and that if... Uh, uh, the, the evaluation report is somehow a sine qua non condition for inscription. Our understanding of the convention, and in particular Article 11.2 of the convention, is that it is not. There is nothing that states that the evaluation report is a sine qua non condition for inscription. The only thing is that this committee has to decide whether OUV is there or not. And obviously we can all agree OUV is there. So. Uh, I really uh, plead with my colleagues uh, to really look at the bigger picture, the 20-year efforts, and the need to preserve this wonderful uh, sites, and also having in view the future and inscribing it on a multi 
or a, a transcontinental basis, both in Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa. So please, let's, uh, let's have that view and, and not be tied down with, uh, with uh, bureaucratic norms. Convention is clear. It is our sovereign responsibility. And as South Africa eloquently said, our decision is credible because we represent your sovereign states. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Ethiopia. Spain, you have the floor, please. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. No creo que haga falta que lo diga, pero lo voy a decir porque no quede ninguna duda. O sea, España en ningún caso ha puesto en tela de juicio la copresidencia ni la honestidad de los mismos. Cuanto ha dicho la copresidencia de Arabia y Noruega es cierto y fueron transparentes y, y así nos gobernamos. Y es verdad que empezamos la tarde siguiendo la estela de la mañana de la enmienda de inscripción que, eh, que España ha mantenido en esa posición desde el principio. Repito, la hemos mantenido muy analizada. Si hubiera sido esta una, una mera candidatura internacional que empieza y acaba en este comité, habríamos dicho que no presentamos la enmienda. Por te, primero porque era una sola candidatura y por temor al presidente que se sentara. Pero la, la analizamos desde la, la dimensión desconocida hasta ahora de candidatura tricontinental, de tres continentes. Pasarán muchos años seguramente hasta que vuelva a aparecer en este comité una candidatura que una tres continentes. Y en este caso nos parecía que se podía hacer la excepción, por cuanto no, no tengo imaginación para poner ejemplos mejores que el de China o el de Brasil, pero siguiendo alguno de ellos nos parecía que aunque de ese vagón se bajara Hungría, como va, es, están en construcción nuevos vagones, podía subirse al siguiente porque quedan muchos segmentos más hasta que tenga vista colectiva, vista global, esta gran candidatura de tres continentes, que no es poca cosa. Por eso le dábamos ese carácter de excepción y decíamos, en el caso de que siente precedente, no se le podrá aplicar a una candidatura internacional de las que ya conocemos, sino será un precedente que valdrá para una candidatura de tres continentes cuando está acabada de construir. Dicho eso, el tiempo nos ha dado la razón de que hacía falta traer el debate aquí, aunque nos incomode un poco, porque cuando eh, algunos colegas nos dicen que no habían estado en la reunión, por la razón que sea, yo no culpabilizo ni estoy en condiciones de decir que no fueron convocados o que ellos se distrajeron y por el trabajo que tienen no atendieron en la convocatoria, como ha dicho el ilustre de la Cámara de Etiopía. Sea cual sea la causa, o sea los medios tecnológicos eh, especiales en los que trabajamos, lo cierto es que no podíamos eh, ser cómplices de que haya delegados de este comité que nos dijeran que no habían tenido la oportunidad de participar. Y por eso lo hemos sometido, ni contra nadie ni a favor de nadie, sino en aras de garantizar la transparencia que las copresidencias de Noruega y de Arabia habían seguido en el comité. Y en esa oportunidad es en la que nosotros mantenemos la posición que teníamos, sin contradecir a nadie, sin criticar a nadie y sin poner en tela de juicio la honestidad de ningún miembro de este comité y menos de la copresidencia noruega y de Arabia, porque hemos trabajado con gusto con ellos y con absoluta transparencia. Nada más y muchas gracias. Gracias, España. Guatemala, por favor, tiene la palabra. Eh, muchas gracias, señor presidente. Eh... No queremos extender más este debate. Eh, se han puesto sobre la mesa eh, muchísimos argumentos, eh, todos ellos válidos, puntos de vista que, que lamentablemente no alcanzan un consenso. Y hemos escuchado con detenimiento estos argumentos y, y vemos que, que al, al tener todos validez y tener todo lógica, eh, tenemos que, que detener el debate, porque pa podríamos pasar días o semanas debatiendo sobre lo mismo y va a ser, eh, percibimos que va a ser casi imposible alcanzar un consenso eh, de todos los miembros del comité sobre este tema que es eh, obviamente sin precedentes. Es una candidatura eh, totalmente extraordinaria el, el pensar en un sitio que abarca tres continentes, o sea, son aspectos fundamentales que tenemos que tomar en cuenta y por lo mismo quizás no sea necesario correr, quizás sea necesario detenernos y meditar y hacer las cosas con la cautela eh, oportuna que mantenga estas eh, nominaciones y estas inscripciones al más alto nivel como este comité lo espera. Entonces, considerando que llevamos días debatiendo y que ahora llevamos ya una hora debatiendo sobre el tema nuevamente y no se alcanza el consenso, quizá nosotros humildemente sugerir 
eh, que se realice una votación sobre cuál será la decisión que tomará este comité, porque no vamos a alcanzar un consenso, eh, hay posiciones encontradas y eh, que no nos permitirán eh, en horas o en días de debate ponernos todos de acuerdo. Entonces quizá sea una, una buena posibilidad de, de, de encontrar una solución y tomar una decisión final sobre el tema que nos concierne y que obviamente ha generado un interés generalizado en todos los miembros del comité, pero que no vamos a terminar pronto de eh, debatir y alcanzar el consenso que sería lo ideal, pero pues eh, a la vista de los argumentos, eso no sucederá. Muchas gracias, señor presidente, y agradezco pues la atención o el interés que otros miembros del comité puedan tener sobre esta propuesta. Gracias, Guatemala. Ethiopia, you have the floor. Ethiopia, we, you have your hand raised. We don't hear you. Yes, Chief, uh, I have my hand raised since uh, after the intervention of Guatemala on a call for a vote. If indeed there's going to be a vote, uh, we ask for a vote to be held on inscription. The vote should be on inscription. That would be our uh, submission. Thank you. Thank you, Ethiopia. Norway, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we take note of this motion and Norway would also support a vote by secret ballot on the inscription. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Norway. So um, thank you all for your understanding and for your very interesting comments and input into this very, very important debate, not just for the countries involved, but for the whole process and um, the development of the convention. So a vote has been called and seconded as in secret ballot. And um, it's been requested to be on the inscription of the nomination. Therefore, I request Dr. Rosler, if you can intervene from the World Heritage Center in order to let us know the administrative steps and request a clarification from UNESCO legal advisor regarding this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. This uh, is in line with Rule 41, so um, a decision uh, on the votes whenever two or more states members shall request so, which happened just now, and then uh, it refers also to Rule 39. Uh, regarding the votes um, uh, which uh, that states members present and voting shall mean states members casting an affirmative or negative vote, therefore states parties abstaining from voting shall be regarded as not voting. Furthermore, Mr. Chair, allow me also to underline that according to Rule 37 of the Rules of Procedures, uh, decisions of the Committee on Matters regard or covered by the provisions of the Convention shall be taken by a majority of two-thirds of its members present and voting, and I think you are aware of this. Now, the voting arrangements have been approved by correspondence by the Committee on 21st of May uh, 21, as per decision of the 15th Extraordinary Session, COM 3, uh, for the conduct of the secret ballot. Now, my understanding is that this um, would uh, happen then tomorrow at nine o'clock. Uh, I think you would have, to, uh, you see it here on the screen by groups. Um, and um, the members of the committee will have to ensure uh, that one of their representatives in Paris is available to come to the UNESCO headquarters to vote. Um, to my understanding, it's again in room five, which is the room you know already in, in front of room one, um, and the secretariat will provide a ballot box and a, a polling booth, and each member of the committee will be given an envelope and a ballot paper on um, arrival in the voting room. Now, I think we have uh, also the two tellers. 
Um, uh, I would like to recall that Mr. Moses Falane from South Africa and Mr. Sabolch Nemes from Hungary had volunteered to do so, so I hope they are still available. Um, and um, the question of voting will be sent by the Secretariat by email to the committee members together with the schedule of vote, of course. And uh, to my understanding, uh, it is um, uh, on the draft decision which was submitted concerning the inscription, but I need to confirm this with you, Mr. Chairperson, but I see also <laughs> the Ambassador of Ethiopia nodding because I think that was your request, Mr. Ambassador, so um, this is concerning uh, the draft on 44.com 8B24 uh, concerning the inscription of this site. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosler. Um, I would like just to um, clarify that uh, as we have been requested by two states, the vote will be um, for inscription, basically uh, accepting yes or no or rejecting a Spain's um, amendment. In Mr. Chair, if I can just clarify, uh, a vote would be um, uh, along those lines are you in favor of inscribing the site, etc.? I think it, it would be, and I see the ambassador of Ethiopia nodding. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosler. Literally, is the amendment, I mean, the vote would be on draft amendment 44.8b.24 submitted by Spain and con sponsored by others. That would be to accept that or not, to agree with that or not. Thank you. Okay, so the procedures and, 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 and basically uh, guidelines for the voting is set for tomorrow, but in order to be fair, I would like to hear and I would like to, I would like to ask the indulgence of the translators and of you, dear delegates and, and, and members of the Secretariat. We still have 10 more minutes as limit, so I would like to hear and give the floor to ECOMOS or the advisory bodies and also the three states involved. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I think there's a committee member which requested the floor before. Ah, they took it off, thank you. Thank you very much. As we have finished the procedure of voting, um, we are not um, we are not hearing any more committee members regarding this uh, debate. Therefore, um, I adjourn the meeting of today. Thank you all very much for this very interesting debate. And um, we have the evening to still consider our voting until tomorrow. Mr. Ro M Ms. Rosler, you have the floor. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Just uh, to recall that we start the session earlier tomorrow, half an hour earlier, Mr. Chair, as you announced. And I also would like to inform you that uh, tomorrow after the session, meaning 30th July from 4 p.m. to 5.30, there is an online event looking into the future highlights of the Regional Action Plan for Africa. We wanted to announce this already today so that you can prepare for your day tomorrow. Thank you very much to all of you. So thank you very much and thank you all again for uh, your involvement and your um, interest in, 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 in getting through the agenda items. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Have a good afternoon. See you tomorrow morning.